Good morning. And welcome to all the folks online as well. We're about half and half. We've got about a total of almost 300 people. Half of them are here in person. Half of you, hello, are online on Zoom. Welcome back to Opman. And we're actually back. I mean, last year we kind of had it, yay. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I was with a friend the other day and they said, I hate COVID. I said, all right, yeah, I get that. But the person said, I feel like I lost three years of my life. It's not right. And I said, she said, it's terrible to lose three years of your life. It just, you don't have that much life. But I said, well, when is a good time to lose three years? I mean, is it when you're young or old? There's never a good time. So it's bad for everybody. It's just good to be back. And welcome especially back to the longtime attendees. It's amazing just walking around this morning how many folks um, I just recognize from the conference year after year after year. So um, thank you especially for, for being back. It's, it's really wonderful to see all of you in person. And, it's well, and I'm welcoming you. I'm Mike Sag from UAB and along with Mark Sokowski from Johns Hopkins. Um, it's great to be here at, at, at Opman. So here we are, this is us in person and virtually. Um, so as usual, we have uh, CME, and this is accredited from Rush University Medical Center. And you can online read all the fine print here about their qualifications, but the key point is for in-person, you get 11.5. CME credits, if you're virtual, you get 9.5. The reason is, unfortunately, we don't have a way of doing the breakouts later this afternoon. That's an hour. We're going to split in two to two 30-minute periods. So unfortunately, only the in-person folks will be able to do that. But the content will be inside the meeting room, the majority of this. So um, I don't, I'm sorry that you're not here, but I know you're going to get a lot out of the conference. We also have a way for people on Zoom who are not in the room to submit questions. I've got an iPad that'll, I'll keep intermixing both the people here live and as well as the questions coming in from the virtual audience. Um, as usual, because this is CME, we're required to stay with on-label uh, commentary, but we can go and talk about off-label things. We just have to notify you when say this is off-label, but sometimes um, an intervention or drug or device can be used for this, but it's not approved by the FDA. We're very grateful for our commercial supporters. You can see them listed here. Um, a number of uh, folks are uh, from each of these companies are here today, and I think if you see them, they've got a little red thing on the bottom of their badge. Just thank them for their help. Of course, you have a registration fee, and the funding from the pharmaceutical partners uh, helps uh, complete the cost to cover the meeting, and so we're very grateful for their assistance. And as usual, um, these are unrestricted educational grants, which means the dollars come in, but the entire content, the choice of subjects, the choice of speakers, is done independently by Dr. Sokowski and me. So you have a brochure for if you're here at the meeting, you have it on your table. If you're at home, you don't have it on your table. Um, sorry. But if you're also here, just you have to wear name badges. If you're at home, you don't. You don't need no stinking badges. Um, and if you need parking, just check with the folks outside. They can get you vouchers and whatnot. Um, and there's a virtual brochure. Looks like I'm wearing the same shirt in that picture that I've got today. You know, COVID, I never went shopping, so. Um, but there it is online for you. And there I am again. So you can click on each topic. Uh, when you go to the online platform, it'll bring up uh, the presentations, and you can see this in the email that was sent to you last night uh, has, gives you access to the slides from today. The virtual login is the same kind of thing, it's just not done here. 
If you need technical assistance, if you're at home and something's messing up, you have it brought up so you haven't lost the signal completely, but it's not working right, just click that little help button and there are staff here, very talented staff, who will be able to get in touch with you. And there's somebody available by phone, but I don't know the number to call. I'll get that for you if you are having difficulty. Now what's really neat is that you got the conference here today, you know, go through the talks, um, that it's gonna be audio and video recorded so that after the meeting it'll be able, you'll be able to live stream it, or not live, you'll be able to restream it like a replay like you would a Netflix show or something on Apple TV. And it might be as entertaining as Schmigadoon the second time around, I don't know, perhaps. But while we're here, um, the question and answer period is, is that uh, after each uh, two talks, we'll come up and have Q&A. Just hold your questions. If you're online, uh, submit them. And I have a, that iPad I told you about. And then the other thing to kind of keep things uh, orderly, um, please turn off your uh, cell phones or just put them on stun. So uh, we don't have to, if you have a call that comes in, you got to take. Obviously, you want to walk out of the room and not do it from your seat. Again, we have ARS. Um, this is from that Poll Everywhere service. Um, you can use your phone. It's all, it's all in the materials. I'm not going to walk through it uh, step by step, but the easiest thing is just to scan the QR code, and you can bring it up. The conference is providing access to the Internet, so... You should be able to get on pretty quickly. Mine, I didn't get asked any log on, so um, if you're having trouble accessing that, just go to the folks in the back, and they can help you with that. Now, the reason I think that Opman has been so successful for 31 years, that's a long time, uh, is because we do look at every uh, review that we get from you. So it's critical, not just important, it's critical that you please fill out the survey. Um, and that tells us what worked, what didn't work, what you want to hear next year, and then we modify uh, year to year based on uh, uh, what we hear from you. And you'll get, you'll get email reminders uh, to, to do that for us. But it doesn't take that long, but its value is, is immeasurable. One of the other things that CME has changed and morphed into is this notion of long-term outcomes measurement. You know, I, it's a little artificial in a way to, you aren't gonna do a chart review, you're not gonna go through and pull the last 100 people you saw and say, what did I change? But I think you can pretty readily say, I picked up this information at the meeting, especially a lot of the review of CROI that we're gonna have that's kind of interwoven into everything that you're gonna hear today and tomorrow. Um, but the change of what you might have done is a survey that you'll get about two to three months from now and just try to bookmark in your head what it is you walked away from the meeting, what you learned, and then a couple months from now say, did I really implement that or not? And just give us some feedback on that. I've already mentioned this, but there's an archive of 2023 so that uh, if, if you want to go back and rewatch one of the presentations, or more importantly, perhaps, if you have a colleague, somebody you work with, um, uh, if you're working with an advanced practice provider who couldn't make the meeting that you work with every day, say, hey, you ought to go online and check out that talk. It was really good. Or maybe even have them watch the whole thing. That's one of the advantages of uh, the new technologies. So when this becomes available, and it turns around pretty quick, we think by early April, certainly before you submit your taxes, uh, you'll be able to get access to this. It won't help you pay your taxes, but you'll be able to access it. So here's our agenda. Um, where are we now? Uh, antiretroviral therapy for Joe Iron from North Carolina. The new drugs, there's a lot of them emerging, especially longer acting drugs. Tripgulic from Cornell, uh, Wow Cornell in New York. Then we'll have our Q&A. <clears throat> Bring up Raj Gandhi, who's uh, from Massachusetts General and Harvard in Boston. Coming into a longstanding presenter, Charlie Flexner. This year, he's gonna talk about the pharmacology and delivering mRNA. 
um, in all kinds of ways. Then we'll have um, questions and answers for Raj and Charlie. Take a break, come back. And Christina Musney is new to the program this year. She's great. I uh, work with her at UAB, and she's going to talk to us about a lot of changes in STI. I, I would predict that among all the things that you'll hear at this meeting, I think there's been a the most change in terms of what we might be doing in that talk. So I want to pay attention to that. And similarly, for PrEP, we have Rafi Landovitz back from UCLA, and he's going to talk to us about PrEP and HIV and a lot of changes there as well. Uh, I've been back to Q&A. Uh, and then we have the cases, whoops, yeah, we have a working lunch with cases um, that goes on for about 50 minutes or so. Then we'll break quickly um, and then go upstairs to the round, uh, round tables. We're doing a little different this year. I think from based on feedback, you had to log in or badge in, badge out. We're not going to do, you're going to be free to go where you want to go. and. At 30 minutes, we'll sort of uh, break briefly, and you can go to another room. A lot of people said, I wanted to see this one, but I also wanted to see that one. And so we just shortened uh, the overall presentations to about 30 minutes. Then you, have, you go to one for 30 minutes. You could stay in that room if you wanted to, but a lot of people will want to move and go to the second one, and we'll wrap up at 2.30. So there we are. Um, these are the breakout sessions you can see here, and it's in your program. There are the rooms, Ibis, Cardinal, Osprey, and Blackbird. Um, only a few of these actually have Beatles songs named after them. Okay, so we're ready to start. Kicking us off, as usual, is Dr. Joe Iron, who's a great friend and wonderful uh, investigator. He's uh, heir apparent to become chair of the AIDS Clinical Trials Group in 2025. And he's going to talk to us about where we are today in antiretroviral therapy. Joe, great. Welcome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I have a great tool. So I like Mike. That's good, huh? Yeah, we, we all like Mike. What would we do without him? All right. So um, I have a lot to say. Um, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, these are my disclosures. This is the outline. Um, this is what we want to do, right? We're, our goal is to restore or maintain the health of our patients, minimize long-term toxicity. We want all people to have access to therapy, uh, and we want to prevent transmission um, to others via any route possible. So that, those are our goals. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is do some voting. Um, I don't know how long I have to might keep this QR thing up. You guys should already be QR ready. Um, so this is a, a woman, 28-year-old, uh, uh, HIV positive at her first prenatal visit. She's anxious. She wants to start therapy. Um, she's 14 weeks gestation by ultrasound. She has no past medical history, no medications, exams normal. She's been vaccinated for hepatitis B. The baseline labs are sent. Would you start therapy now? Yes or no? Now, this will take a little bit longer. What therapy would you start? She's pregnant, you don't know your labs yet, and you wanna know, we wanna know what to start. So some people are using um, uh, BF-TAF, almost the majority, 46%, Dalutegravir plus TAF FTC. Some people wanna use TDF FTC, uh, and then you can and see the others. So this, this is great, this is really good. Um, Okay, so these are, this is a slide I've shown a bunch of times. These are our, our guidelines um, in DHHS, and then we have representatives of the DHHS, the ISUSA. We have the leader of the ISUSA um, guidelines committee here sitting in the front who we'll talked to you in a few minutes. Um, and, and I just, there are a couple things to point out. Um, so dolutegravir-based therapy is recommended for women of childbearing potential. Um, that's ISUSA. And actually, uh, that's DHHS. And actually, ISUSA actually recommends TAF FTC. And that's based on um, weight gain studies uh, uh, done in, uh, by the IMPACT group. And actually, weight gain is good during pregnancy. And, and pregnancy outcomes and infant outcomes were better 
in uh, women who receive TAF. So that's, that's a difference. The other difference that's important to point out is just that, um, and, and I'm sure Rafi's going to talk about this, is that you, if you have a new patient who's HIV um, uh, infected and recently received long-acting cabotegravir, uh, the recommendation is to get resistance testing. And while you're waiting, or if you can't get resistance testing, it's actually to use a darunavir-based therapy. So that's different. Um, uh, that's kind of new information. OK. Um, so what questions remain about initial therapy? I mean, what is there left to talk about? Do we need baseline resistance testing? Actually, probably not for their initial therapy, but, but I still do it. Um, uh, it may be helpful later on, and, and certainly it, it's informative to the CDC and other groups um, looking at transmission clusters. And then is there any reason not to give either Bictegravir or Dalutegravir? Um, what about you know, uh, weight gain. We we're, were like two years ago, that's all we could talk about was weight gain. Uh, and I'm going to show you something that convinces me it's all about efavirenz and TAF, uh, TDF, and not about um, uh, TAF or uh, BIC or dalutegravir. Um, are there uh, cardiovascular events associated with um, uh, uh, NSTE therapy? That was in the Lancet HIV a year ago. Um, and, and it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> it was odd. It was about one and a half to two-fold increase in cardiovascular events over about a year and a half to two years, and then it went away. Are there um, immune modulating effects of, of integrase inhibitors? Maybe. Uh, or are there ra rare adverse events? There's uh, a really nice case series that's listed here. It's very small. That I think is pretty convincing that rarely Bictegravir is associated uh, with diabetes. I have not seen anything that would change my approach. Well, people do gain weight when they go on um, uh, either uh, Bictegravir TAF FTC or Dalutegravir TAF FTC. Uh, over um, two years, they gain, you know, three and a half, four kilograms. Um, but this study is, is I think, that, uh, the nail in the uh, um, coffin that it's all about of favorins and TDF. The TDF you guys have seen, you go on TDF, you lose weight, you go off TDF, you gain weight. This is done in Africa, 23,000 people. This is from Croy. I'm sorry, Raj, if you're going to talk about this. But, but basically, the red line are people on nevirapine who then switch to dalutegravir right in the middle at zero. And you can see they just gain weight kind of gradually. There's absolutely no, the blue line uh, is when people are on a favorins, and right in the middle, they switch to dalutegravir, and look what happens. It's really the removal of a favorins that leads to weight gain. I, I, there's no question in, in my mind um, about this. So, um, and, and I think in the um, advanced study, it's really a favorins that's keeping people from gaining weight. Um, that's mainly what's going on. Now, whether a small percentage of people on integrase gain a ton of weight, I think that's possible, and I don't understand that. And we can deal with this in the question and answer. And then the Swiss cohort, the, the, just a brilliant cohort. Um, this is just showing that um, if you look at cardiovascular events on integrase inhibitors and, and other therapy, whoa, look at that. There are more cardiovascular events. But on the right, if you actually adjust for things, especially if you adjust for um, uh, a back of ear use, um, and other things like age and smoking and BMI and hypertension, the, the imp impact of uh, integrase um, inhibitors go away. So I don't see any reason not to start therapy with either Bictegravir or Dalutegravir, period, the end. Okay. Um, the one thing is, do we actually need a, a regimen, a first-line regimen about without integrase or without uh, a, a TDF um, initial regimen? And I, I think Raj might talk a little bit about Aslactravir, and, and, um, but I'm just not sure what we're going to do with that um, when it becomes available. So what about people that are really hard to treat? And I, I hit a slide, which I shouldn't have hit, but these are data from Monica Gandhi and the UCSF group looking at people with treatment challenges. And uh, this, this um, so it's over 130 individuals now. And I think 57 of them were actually viremic. So they're viremic people, and they started on cabotegravir ropivirine injectable. 
That's not how it's indicated. As Mike, I have to say, it's not how it's indicated. And this graph on the left-hand side shows that I think it's 55 out of 57 actually became suppressed of these viremic people. Um, two failed, uh, and the, the, the details are listed there. They both had high viral loads, and they didn't suppress, and they developed resistance. I'm not recommending this, but in some situations, people are doing this for people they just can't suppress otherwise. Right? This is not something you would do to someone who can easily take pills. These are people that just cannot be suppressed on oral therapy. OK, so what about switching? Um, well, there's a lot of rationale for switching. I'm not going to read this. You guys all know uh, the rationale. But I, my mantra is the simplest, safest therapy that fits into a person's life. And, and not my life, <laughs> but their life. You know, I'm, I, you know, so I think that's really important. So we're going to vote again. So here's a guy, 45 years old. He was diagnosed at age 30. He's taken his medicine, uh, first Favrin's based, then Elvitegravir based, then Bictegravir based. His CD4 is um, 750. His uh, viral load is not detected. He's never had virologic failure, no side effects. He takes, the only other pill he takes is atorvastatin for, for cholesterol management. Would you discuss two drug therapy with him? Yes or no? Ah, that's interesting. Oh, very good. Huh. So, so 38% of people said no and 62% and yes. Very, very interesting. We should really talk about this. Would you discuss long-acting injectable therapy with him? No side effects, no medication issues. Ah, so some people say no, he's doing well. I'm not going to talk about it. Yes, if he brings it up. Yes, remember, it's what fits into their life, not your life. <laughs> and if you're busy, it takes too much time, you don't want to talk about it, that's me sometimes. But remember, it's their life, not your life. Um, all right, so there's been a boatload of switch studies, right? And no offense to our pharmaceutical friends that are probably in the back somewhere. You do these to show that it works, and people that you know it will work with, right? I mean... Every, uh, there are very few switch studies that didn't work. So there's a whole bunch of switch studies that work. Uh, and that's fine. And the, the most recent ones are based on cabotegravir or ropivirine, which is good. Um, this is the SOLAR study. It was just presented at CROI. This study is a little tiny bit different in that, number one, uh, everyone had to be on BF-TAF. And then it was a randomized two-to-one switch, not one-to-one, two-to-one. Uh, and um, the oral lead-in was optional. Um, uh, and so I'm not going to really say too much more about it. Not surprisingly, people did very well. Uh, 90 plus percent stayed suppressed. Like the other studies, a small number of people, despite getting on-time injections, did have confirmed virologic failure. There were two, only two. So, so that's remarkable um, out of over 400, so just two. But they did have integrase mutations, so that happens. Um, but what I want to show is this slide, and just look at the reasons why people preferred being on injectable. Now, these people go, are going into a randomized trial of injectable. So that's, this isn't everybody. These are people that kind of wanted to be on injectable, probably. But I don't have to worry. It's more convenient. I don't have to carry my medications with me. I do not have to think about my HIV every day. I do not have to worry that others might see me taking my medicine. So these are things that affect people's life. And that's why I think we do need to ask people if they might want to be on an injectable. Um, so what's, uh, what are the benefits? Less frequent dosing, obviously. Pill fatigue or anxiety about pill taking. Um, it obviously bypasses the GI system. So they're in the uh, bioavailability is very high. There are less drug interactions. Um, the protection of privacy, maybe in here, adherence is better, but, and this is a but, there is a small but quantifiable risk, even with on-time dosing and no evidence of low drug levels of virologic failure and integrase resistance. That, and if you think about it, people, you know, um, that's not going to happen to me. I'm going to smoke because it's not going to happen to me. Uh, a lot of my patients, you talk about this, no, I want to be on injectable. That's fine. It's not going to happen to me. 
It's a, you know, like you're going to win the lottery and, and you're not going to be in a car accident. You know, those are the things that... Um, the thing to remember is if you have a history of virologic failure, that increases the risk. And of course, if you have ropivirine resistance mutations, just, just don't do it. Now, and we can discuss at our question and answer about whether, well, should you get, you know, some sort of archive genotype um, before you start? Right? Let's, let's do that. Let's find out if they're ropivirine resistance. That's, that's a good question. We can talk about it. Okay, here's our third case. Um, this is a, a man diagnosed a long time ago in a, in a galaxy far, far away. Um, he's partially suppressed uh, for years, you know, going through everything. You know, those of you with some gray hair know this person. You, you know, you gave him all you could. Um, to, you might even have given him um, uh, um, infuvertide. Um, but when darunavir, ritonavir, etrovirine, and raltegravir came out, you got him suppressed. And he's been suppressed the entire time. Uh, and he's now on dalutegravir, TAF, FTC. He's still on twice daily darunavir, ritonavir, and ropivirine. Um, and, and he's actually referred to you because he's hyperlipidemic. He had a stent placed, and he's so tired of taking pills. Um, he looks okay in exam. Uh, his creatinine's not quite normal. His ALT is a little bit high. He probably has a little fat in his, in his right upper quadrant. Um, but here's his genotype, right? He's got K65R. He's got a bunch of um, old AZT resistance mutations, which uh, for people younger than the age of 50, you don't have to remember them. You can just forget about them. They're irrelevant. Um, it, but he does have 184V. You have to remember that one. He's got NNRTI mutations. He's probably partially sensitive to ropivirine based on Stanford. And he's got enough protease inhibitor mutations to, you know, Re, you know, change the structure of the virus practically. And the highlighted ones are darunavir resistance mutations. Um, again, you can just Google that. You don't need to remember that. And um, back in the day, he joined a study, and you know he has dual mixed virus. Um, so, um, but this is actually a lot of our population. This comes from the scenics. Um, this is looking at people who are suppressed, and the red line are people with limited treatment options, which was defined as resistance in more than two categories. I think Mike might have been the brainchild behind this. And what you can see is that there, a lot of these people are suppressed. They're suppressed, but some of them are taking a lot of drugs. Um, so what antiviral therapy treatment would you choose? You're like, A, I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to mess with this. It's he's suppressed. You know, take, give, him, give him more atorvastatin, switch him to rosuvastatin, do something else. Um, instead, you're going to stop the darunavir, ritonavir, because it's on twice a day, and you're just going to keep them on the other medicines, boosted, uh, uh, not boosted, uh, dalutegravir, TAF, FTC, and ropivirine, because he's got so many resistance mutations that it's probably not doing anything. You're going to switch to bictegravir, TAF, FTC alone. No guts, no glory. Or you're going to do something like that and then add something else, maybe a little shot of lenacapavir, not how it's um, uh, approved to use, or maybe fostemsvir, well tolerated, or something else. This is hard, so we can take an extra minute on this one. <laughs> ah, this is great. Oh my God, look at this. And, and votes are still coming in. <laughs> are, are people allowed to, the, all the online people are all voting, right, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> this is really, really great. Uh, I love 15% said switch to BF TAF alone. That was Raj. He hit that button, I'm sure. Um, yeah, this is great. I don't know exactly what to do, but I, I would not probably not do number one. I, I, would, I, would, I would probably do number two, which is just stop the derunavir ritonavir. It's almost certainly not doing anything. This person's been suppressed for 15 years, um, and it's probably OK. Or, um, I don't know how you would get off-label on a Capavir, maybe. Um, but, or I might do the, um, the bottom one. Uh, not, not the bottom one, but the um, Fostemzivir. Um, so uh, uh, BF-TAF plus uh, Fostemzivir. But that would be twice a day, so it would be a little bit complicated. Why do we think we can do this? Um, well, we know from a now whole bunch of studies listed here that people with extensive NRTI and NNRTI resistance 
will suppress on either Bic Tegavir, TAF, FTC, or there's more data with Dalia Tegavir uh, based therapy in people who are actually viremic. So if it works in viremic people, um, it should work in suppressed people. Um, and the, the second line, those are the viremic studies. Um, Nick Patton, from, as, like he has a New England Journal paper every other day now. Um, and uh, or there's a second line switch study. There's the VSEND study. Um, I'll just show you, this is from Croy. This is the VSEND study. You can just look at the donuts in the middle. Um, uh, uh, this is the prevalence of NRTI mutations in this study. It's a second line study. These are first line failures. So 92% of them have NRTI resistance. And of that 92%, half, half had K65R. And 95.8% of those people stay suppressed when they switched to either um, TLD, which is, um, uh, oh my god, uh, 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 T, uh, oh, sorry, uh, TDF, lamivudine, and dal dalutegavir, or TAFED, which I hate, uh, which is uh, TAF, um, uh, FTC, and, and dalutegavir. I, ha I, not, I don't hate the drugs. I, I just hate TAFED. It sounds so weird. Um, so it, it just works. It's like amazing. And this guy we were talking about, his protease inhibitor mutations are irrelevant, right? Uh, they're irrelevant. So he has a lot of them. So what? Um, and, you know, the fact that he's got dual mixed virus, who cares? <laughs> but I, I'm not that brave, so I probably would have continued his ropivirine or given him fosatemzavir. And <laughs> the one thing that um, we don't have a lot of data on, this is, from, um, this is from Nadia. Some of the people who were viremic and switched to dalutegravir TDF FTC did have virologic failure with resistance. That's the bottom bit. Most of them were on zidovudine, right? That's the top bit. The bottom bit, uh, the last three, there were three people in that study um, uh, that uh, developed resistance. Curiously, they developed the same pattern of resistance. And, and I don't think we've seen all, all the data we want to see um, uh, from that study. But they're, they're, in people who are viremic anyway, there might be some risk. So finally, I just want to talk about virologic failure. Um, the, I think the guidelines still, still have this, you know, second line therapy, uh, Trip or Raj could correct me, you know, are you PI susceptible? I think that's no longer relevant. Um, it's really, if you have second line failure and beyond, the, the question you should ask yourself is, do you have integrase susceptibility? If you have integrase susceptibility, the, the what is it, the world is your oyster? I don't actually know what that means, but my mother said it. Um, uh, and um, uh, so you could use Tegravir, Dahlia Tegravir plus nukes. I'm actually going to change that. It's not nukes. It's TDF or TAF FTC, not just nukes. I need to fix that slide. Uh, and you might add something else if you're anxious, um, especially if someone has a ton of resistance and you just don't know what would happen if it doesn't work. Um, but if they're not dalutegravir or bictegravir susceptible, then it's a lot harder, right? If they're PI susceptible, you're going to use a boosted PI almost certainly. If they're not, then you have to use new drugs. Um, Tripp's going to talk about some new drugs. The newest drug that we now have is lenacapavir. This is kind of a typical, you know, FDA um, uh, highly drug resistant study uh, called Capella. Th this, this, ca this came from Monica Gandhi and, and I kind of messed it up so I'm not going to talk about it very much only to say it's a typical study where people got lenacapavir, um, showed that it was um, uh, virologically active in one group uh, and, then, um, uh, and then got optimized therapy and, and continued on and, and basically, it, it clearly worked. This is 52-week data. It was at IES. It was at ID Week. It was at Glasgow. It was at Croy. <laughs> These companies really like to drill it into our heads, right? No matter what meeting you go to, there's going to be a presentation. But basically, if you look at it, about 75% of a small number of people, it's only about 72 people, um, uh, stayed suppressed. So in the bottom left, oh, I forget, I didn't use my cool pointer mic. Um, over here is with or without um, integrase resistance. Maybe it's a little bit better if you don't have integrase resistance. 
up here. It's, um, you know, it looks at uh, virologic failure in a smaller uh, uh, cohort. So, so most of the uh, uh, lack of success is indeed virologic failure, and you can get lenacapavir resistance, unfortunately. And finally, um, uh, oops, I got to hit the trash. Hit the trash. There we go. Uh, if you here's using the here, if you use fostemzivir, that looks pretty good actually. Um, uh, so, uh, but also ibilizumab also improved outcome again small numbers. None of these comparisons are statistically significant. So, what about lenacapavir? What do we know? Well, it's a caps inhibitor. You, it's it's these are these are the indication. This is right from the package insert. It is for heavily treatment experienced patients, uh, participants, people living with HIV, multidrug resistant infection, failing their current therapy. So that's different than the guy we talked about. I, I thought maybe it didn't say that, but I went and looked. It says failing their current therapy. Now, could you argue that having a, a cholesterol of 300 is failing? Maybe. No, Tripp says no, you can't. Um, uh, there are injection reactions. These are real injection reactions. They just don't happen very often because it's every six months, right? Um, uh, and if you miss a, a dose of more than uh, 28 weeks since the last, it's clinically appropriate, but you have to restart the initiation. The treatment is you actually give oral therapy for two days, and, and uh, on the first day, there's an injection. Um, you have to be careful about um, SIP. 3A inducers, you forget it's an injection, but, but they're drug interactions, so inducers are, are not good. Um, and obviously, <laughs> lenacapavir is going to be with your patient for a while. And it is a modest but real inhibitor of CYP3A, um, so there are drug interactions, right? It will raise levels of certain things, um, uh, so, so you need to be careful. It will actually raise fentanyl levels. So there may be uh, risk in, in uh, substance users. Um, there's no change with renal impairment, though not studied in end-stage renal disease. Uh, and there's no uh, dose change in mild or moderate liver disease, but not studied in end-stage liver disease. And you know, you I would talk to someone in the know like Trip or um, uh, about what you would do if you had someone on dialysis that needed it. Um, so here's my summary. Um, Optimal initial treatment can likely be limited to two or three Bictegavir, Dalutegavir based options. That's my opinion. Um, there is a risk of, uh, of weight gain. It's an unsolved problem, but, but I think it, it's mostly return to health, um, or as someone said at the last meeting, return to ill health. We don't exercise, we eat all kinds of junk, and our patients do too, so it's return to ill health. Um, simplification should be a goal, a uh, common goal in practice, and long-acting injectable is available every two months with no oral lead-in. Um, but there is that small risk of integrase resistance, even with on-time therapy. Um, patients with a history of substantial resistance who are suppressed are common. They're very common, especially with people that have been doing this a long time, and there are ways to simplify. Uh, and there are options for treatment simplification possible, especially if there's no integrase resistance. Uh, and thank you very much. Very nice. Okay, our next speaker to talk to us about new drugs. A little bit like Bill Maher and new rules, but these are new drugs is Dr. Tripp Gulick, who is the Chief of Infectious Diseases at Weill Cornell Medical Center. He's also the chair or co-chair of the DHHS Antiretroviral Therapy Guidelines, so he's in a great position to keep track of what's new in new drugs. Thanks a lot, Mike. So 31 years of Opman. Croy turned 30 this year. Glasgow turned 30 this year. Opman is the long-term survivor here of the conferences. We all enjoyed Joe's talk, but did I hear him say that he took up smoking? <laughs> did you guys hear that? Anyway, we're going to talk about new drugs for HIV. I have no disclosures, but this entire talk 
almost, is going to be off-label for the FDA because these are new drugs. So do we need new drugs for HIV? Today in 2023, <clears throat> we have 35 drugs approved for the treatment of HIV. But the pipeline is full. There are many other drugs or candidate drugs that are in development. And you can see these are in our current classes. Nukes, non-nukes, PIs, entry inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, and the newest class of capsid inhibitors. And then there are two newer drug classes that are also coming along. The unfortunately abbreviated MIs, which are maturation inhibitors, and then the BNABs, the broadly neutralizing antibodies that you've heard about. Now, I'm not going to cover all the compounds that you see here. What I've done is to pick out some that are the farthest in development. I'm going to briefly mention lenacapavir and then focus on the two new classes. So let's jump right in. A compound that we've been watching for a while is islatravir. This is a nucleoside analog. It's an adenosine analog. It's a DNA chain terminator, and it inhibits reverse transcriptase by preventing translocation. So it's an NRTTI, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. One of the remarkable qualities of this drug is its long half-life, 50 to 60 hours in plasma. That should allow infrequent dosing. It's potent in the test tube against HIV-1, 2, and multidrug resistant strains. And one of the other exciting qualities of this compound is that it can be given at low dose and parenterally through injections. So we saw phase 1b early data, and you can see here we're looking at the change in viral load level on a log scale. Oh, and I get to use this cool thing. And at the highest doses, you can see that there was a uh, two log drop in virus. So this is a potent drug. And so this paved the way <clears throat> for a number of studies for both treatment and prevention using islatravir. So using it daily, but also using it weekly for treatment, monthly for prevention, or even yearly, annually, when used as an implant. And all of those studies got launched and then something happened. What was that? An unusual toxicity was described with this compound. And uh, you don't need to see the details there, but the colored bars are showing you changes in lymphocyte counts, total lymphocyte. So in uh, the top part here, the green bars are the islatravir arm compared to the purple bars, which were the control arm. In the second study, which was a treatment study, the blue bars show you the islatravir arms. And in the third study, again, green showing you islatravir. In each of these studies, lymphocyte counts went down. And actually, if you look over on the right, we're looking at a phase two dose ranging study. Here is the lymphocyte count in the control arm, flat. The lower dose of islatravir there and the higher dose there. So this looked like it was dose dependent. So an unusual lymphocyte toxicity. There is, uh, this is an unusual toxicity of a drug. Get rid of all that. So because of this toxicity, FDA placed a clinical hold on studies using oral, injectable, or even implantable islatravir, or a novel two-drug combination of deraverine and Islatravir and said, we need to understand this toxicity before we will move, allow the company to move any of these studies forward. So to their credit, the pharmaceutical company did a lot of work on this to try to figure out this unusual toxicity. And we heard about what they found at this year's CROI. So the first thing to know is no other blood cell lines were affected. No neutrophils or other white count other white blood cells decreased. Red blood cells and platelets were maintained. So it's specific to lymphocytes. And I should say that includes CD4 positive lymphocytes. No signals were seen when the company reviewed earlier animal studies and earlier phase one, two studies. So this really only came out in phase two and three. 
And they finally came up with a likely mechanism here, and it looks like it's is latrovir triphosphate, so like the other nucleosides, the active compound inside cells leads to apoptosis, meaning cellular death, and that this was not related to mitochondrial toxicity. Well, they also, as shown in one of the graphs, figured out this was dose-dependent. It is reversible if you stop the compound, so lymphocyte counts go back to normal. And in none of the studies was a low lymphocyte count associated with infections. So they went on to suggest and do some modeling that showed that a very low daily dose of 0.25 milligrams and an, a low weekly dose of only 2 milligrams would be optimal in that it would preserve the antiviral activity but essentially have no associated lymphocyte toxicity. So studies, the FDA agreed with this, and those studies will now move forward. So before that happened, we saw these results of a phase 2B treatment study looking at a novel two-drug regimen using Islatrovir with the NNRTI Duraverine. This enrolled treatment-naive people with viral load levels at least 1,000, CD4s above 200, and no resistance. And it was a small study of 120 people. They were randomized to Islatrovir at one of three doses combined with 3TC and Duraverine, and then there was a control arm with TDF, 3TC, and Duraverine, so two nukes and a non-nuke. But then they switched the is latrovir duraverine arms to a two-drug regimen with just those two drugs, uh, and that was done at weeks 24 to 48 weeks after achieving virologic suppression, and everybody was allowed to continue. So what you see over on the left are how many people in each group suppressed below 50, and you see comparable responses, about 80 to 90 percent in all three is latrovir groups, as well as the two nukes plus duraverine group and you see very few virologic failures shown in the middle. So they went on to uh, look at follow-up. These were 48 weeks, and they were published in Lancet HIV, and then they subsequently reported two-year results and even three-year results, and saw durability of suppression with the Duraverine is Latrovir daily regimen. So as Joe previewed for us, two-drug daily regimens which are potent might be a good option for some people. Well, that paved the way for the phase three studies, and we heard these at CROI. So this was called the 017 study. Get rid of that. And uh, this was a large study, 672 people, who came into the study with ART suppressed on an ART regimen, either two or three drugs, who had their viral load suppressed below 50, and no history of treatment failure on any regimen. They were stratified by a number of factors, but then randomized to either get open label Duraverine is Latrovir, given daily, or continue the regimen they were already on. And what we saw were the week 48 results. And as Joe previewed, another switch study Everybody did well, so 94 to 95 percent, whether they continued their oral regimen or with uh, conventional ART or switched to this novel regimen of his latrovir duraverine. Everybody did well. In the very next presentation was a companion study with a similar design. So this, too, enrolled over 600 people from 11 countries, but as opposed to allowing any ART regimen to come in with suppression, they specifically required it to be Bictegravir with two nukes, Bictegravir, TAF, and FTC. Same randomization, one-to-one, um, -one, so half went to Duraverine and Islatrovir, and half continued the Bictegravir regimen, and this won't surprise you. Once again, everybody did well. So 94% of all people continued suppression. So both these phase three studies certainly would support moving forward with this novel two-drug regimen of Islatrovir and Duraverine. Well, what about prevention? Where were we? One of the studies that was being looked at was a once-a-month dosing 
of Islatravir that was going to look at that as a PrEP drug. But again, concerns about the lymphocyte toxicity really have sidelined that. What's not been sidelined is the quest for an Islatravir implant, similar to a birth control implant that could be implanted perhaps once a year. So at Croy, we saw several um, investigations in animals using Islatravir implants. This briefly summarizes a vaginal biodegradable implant, so meaning that over time it just erodes, just goes away in the body, which is pretty cool. And uh, they studied it in macaques, and it protected five of six macaques with a vaginal challenge, and the one breakthrough animal had low as Latravir levels. And even more interesting, perhaps, was what they called ultra-long-acting. You ever heard that before? Well, what they meant that, that to be was three to four year implants. Uh, these were nano fabricated, biocompatible, silicon nano channel membrane refillable. So you could actually squirt back in the drug implants and they would elute Islatravir over time. They uh, did a pharmacokinetic study in animals, and they had constant Islatravir plasma and Islatravir triphosphate levels for over 20 months uninterrupted. And these were above pre-established PrEP protection benchmark concentrations. And then they went on to challenge monkeys and found that they were 100% protective, the monkeys with these implants, to either rectal or vaginal challenges. So exciting data here to think about implants as a mode of future prevention strategies. Okay, let's switch gears. Non-nucleosides. So a compound we've been watching for a while has been called MK8507. It just got a name, eulonivirine. Just rolls right off the tongue, right? So this is an investigational NNRTI. It's quite potent in the test tube, and it's active against more common NNRTI-resistant variants. Once again, the distinguishing feature is its long half-life, over 70 hours, and that would support once-weekly oral dosing. So you can see where the field is going here, right? We are investigating simpler regimens like a weekly oral regimen, and some people probably would like that. Imagine every Sunday night you take your ART regimen, for instance. Uh, a phase one study was completed in treatment-naive patients and showed it was generally well tolerated. And once again, you can see viral load decay at the highest levels here was about 1.5 logs, showing that it was quite potent. And so that paved the way for future discovery. And they concluded that this would support weekly combination dosing. But what happened? First, they characterized the resistance of this. And it turns out a substitution at 106 was the primary mutation. There was decrease in activity five-fold with other common NNRTI mutations like 103, 181, and 190. And if you compare this, up top is eulonivirine in blue, and deraverine, the NNRTI is shown at the bottom, and you can see the profiles look pretty similar. So it has a resistance profile pretty similar to deraverine. So off they went with a phase two study of weekly dosing, combined with Islatravir, the, drug, the candidate drug we just talked about, so weekly oral dosing, and unfortunately saw the same lymphocyte toxicity, and that study was halted or paused. So this compound currently is being sidelined while further investigation moves forward. Okay, capsid inhibitors. We've been introduced to these recently, and as you well know, it's a new mechanism of action. So reminder that HIV comes in, enters the cell, and then the green structure is the capsid, and that must disassemble to expose viral DNA and viral enzymes inside the cytoplasm of the cell. The cell is taken over, as we all know. New proteins are synthesized, and new virions form, but the capsid has to reassemble for full maturation and infectiousness to occur. So what's novel about these new compounds, 
the capsid inhibitors is that they target two steps in the viral life cycle. So both capsid disassembly and capsid assembly are targeted. And the compound that you know that just got approved by the FDA is lenacapavir. So potent in the test tube and once again a long half-life, 30 to 43 days, has oral and sub-Q formulations and went through phase one, phase two, and phase two to three testing in heavily treatment experienced patients. So we've been following these. The third study is the one Joe reviewed called the um, Capella study. And uh, that showed that it had significant activity in people with heavily multi-drug resistant HIV, and that led the FDA to approve this compound for that group, as we've heard. So FDA approved just uh, last December, just a couple of months ago. So what do we know new about this? Well, it has been studied in treatment naive patients in a study called Calibrate, and uh, you can see the forearms of the study shown for you here. So lenacapavir being used sub-Q every six months, with companion drugs in the first two arms, oral lenacapavir in the green arm with uh, TAF and FTC, and then a control arm of bictegravir, TAF, and FTC. But it, actually, it doesn't much matter, because what we're looking at here is what proportion were suppressed in each group. And you can see the two sub-Q lenacapavir arms with nukes in treatment-naive people did just as well as the all-oral regimen in green or the Bictegravir regimen in the purple color. So everyone did well, and what we learned new is that that was durable out to 80 weeks of follow-up. So good news in terms of treatment naive, although, as Joe pointed out, lenacapavir only approved for heavily treatment experienced at the moment. So that study, whoa, get rid of that. Um, Joe showed you this, was the Capella study done in heavily treatment experienced patients. And what we learned new about that study at Croy, they looked at all the subgroups of that heavily treatment experienced group. You can see overall in the green bars, 78% of heavily treatment experienced patients who optimized their background regimen and added the new compound lenacapavir were able to resuppress through 52 weeks. And uh, Joe showed you some of these data in terms of subgroups that they looked at. So they looked at people who, up in the top left, age didn't make a difference, male, female, similar responses, um, race and where you lived in the US, similar responses, not statistically different. Down at the bottom, the number of fully active agents in the optimized background regimen, you see a trend favoring more active agents, which is what we would expect. And then baseline CD4, you can see people with higher CD4s or lower viral loads had numerically better responses, as you might guess. Turns out not to be statistically different. And then Joe showed you that if you add another new drug, like ibilizumab, or fostemzivir, again, numerically better in each of those groups. So this really tells us how to use lenacapavir in treatment experience patients. What about len for prevention? So lenacapavir, obviously being conveniently dosed, sub-Q every six months would be a very nice option for prevention. And what we heard at the CROI meeting was a, and I'm just summarizing the results here, that that regimen protected macaques against rectal shiv challenges over time. So animal data to support moving forward. Phase three studies are now planned in uh, a number of different groups. And you can see here the control arm will be tenofovir, either TDF or TAF, with FTC. So the FDA approved therapies head to head versus lenacapavir. These studies are being called the purpose studies. Number one will be in adolescent girls and young women in two African countries. Purpose two will be MSM and transgender women in the US, South Africa, Peru, and Brazil. And purpose three is gonna be done also with the HIV Prevention Trials Network, study number 102, which will be cisgender women in the US. 
So more about lenacapavir for prevention to come. All right, BNABs. What are BNABs? Broadly neutralizing antibodies. The structure that you see here is GP120. And the different antibodies bind to different parts of GP120. So you can see the V1, V2 loop, the CD4 binding site where GP120 actually attaches to the cell, the V3 stem, and the membrane protein external region, or EMPER. And what you see listed with each of the colors are the groups of antibodies that bind to those parts of GP120 and then prevent infection of the virus. So in a sense, BNABs are HIV entry inhibitors. And there's been a lot of information. A lot of these have been um, discovered. Over 17 have been evaluated for safety and pharmacokinetics in humans, so clinical data. And generally, they've been seen to be safe and have potent antiretroviral activity. What distinguishes them is their vaccinal effect. So not only do they act as antiretrovirals, but they seem to also have the capability to enhance host immunity, which would be a novel property. There's been a lot of uh, discovery work, strategies to improve their potency, their breadth against multiple strains of HIV, their serum half-life to make them more convenient, and delivery options in terms of either infusion um, and trying to steer them towards sub-Q injections for convenience. And what we've seen are more potent, broader, and multi-specific antibodies that have longer half-lives, allowing dosing every two to six months, and as I mentioned, sub-Q dosing. And some of these have been combined with each other, so two, three, and four broadly neutralizing antibody combo studies, and in addition, combination with long-acting antiretrovirals. And our own Joe Eron presented these data at CROI, combining lenacapavir, remember can be given sub-Q every six months, with two long-acting broadly neutralizing antibodies, which have the most attractive names that you can possibly imagine. Teropavivimab, TAB, I like TAB, right? Reminds us of that soft drink with the pink. Um, and then Zinlirviv, okay, Zinlirvimab, Zinlirvimab. Joe, how are we doing? And that's ZAB. So basically, this was a very small pilot study that enrolled people who had been virologically suppressed, had susceptibility to both of the BNABs, CD4 nadir above 350, and CD4 entry above 500. And again, this was a pilot study. Can we add a long-acting antiviral, lenacapavir, to two long-acting BNABs? One was given at two different doses. And here's the answer. So in this group, 90%, so all but two, people were able to suppress their viral loads to less than 50 by the end of six months with a single infusion of these three compounds. So this is exciting for the future. Could we really have an ART regimen given by infusion or injection every six months? That may be the future. Okay, last and not least are the MIs. Ouch. <laughs> So the HIV maturation inhibitors. We're at the very last part of the life cycle, and there are these large polyproteins. They have to be cleaved for full maturation to occur. And what cleaves them? Well, of course, the HIV protease. We're quite good, and we know all about that. But another way to, to uh, inhibit the cleavage is to actually bind parts of these polyproteins together. And when that's done, the compound is called a maturation inhibitor. So it prevents full maturation of the virus by keeping that polyprotein stuck together. Now, if that sounds familiar, boom, these have been around for a while. So you may remember Bavirimat made its way into phase two. Unfortunately, 50% of patients had natural polymorphisms rendering this compound resistant. So that was not pursued. A second compound moved forward and made it to phase 2B. Unfortunately, had significant GI tolerance, so that too was given up. A third one emerged, 
and that made it to phase 2A2, but unfortunately, its pharmacokinetics required boosting. And the feeling here is that we would no longer accept a boosted drug in our field, that we're getting away from pharmacokinetic boosting. So that was sidelined. That led to the fourth one called 254, made it to phase one in HIV, drug interactions, and had few, which paved the way for a phase two study, which was recently published by Chris Spinner from Munich. And that looked at a group of treatment-naive people who received this new maturation inhibitor. And here's the change in viral load results. And unfortunately, four of six people developed mutations after just several days of dosing. So while it was safe and well-tolerated and does show an antiviral effect here, apparently it had a low barrier to resistance. And we just learned that this will not move forward. So depressing way to end my talk, but know that there are further maturation inhibitors that are in the pipeline. And of course, for people with multi-drug resistant HIV, although they're fewer, we do need options and drugs with new mechanisms of action can help. So keep your eye on this class. And I'll just uh, acknowledge some helpers with this talk and thanks for your attention. Yeah, please, come on up, Dr. Iran. So we have questions that have come in on the iPad, and uh, if you have questions here, you can come to the microphone or uh, just write them down on a question card, wherever you want, but probably better if you come to the microphone. If you remember the spirit of this meeting, going back to its initial days, um, was to have relatively equal time for the talks and the discussion, so we have a good amount of time here where we can uh, talk about that. So I'll start with a, um, a question from Bernard Nash um, that he says, I find it difficult to get patients in for every two month injections. Uh, that that it, some do, but some people are late to show up. And just based on your early experience or what you're hearing, uh, what do you say to them about um, how, how we can improve compliance, adherence with that approach? Um, yeah, I, Tripp may have thoughts too, but um, I think that is an issue. We, we thought it was going to be a bigger issue than it was. Um, we had a very hard time at our site during COVID. Nobody really wanted to come in every two months, but now that um, um, you know people feel more comfortable, um, it's surprising the number of people that come to our site from a long way that have to park and all this other stuff to get two monthly injection. I think that you know not having a lead in going straight to two months um, is <clears throat> certainly helps. Um, but I agree, it's it's certainly it's certainly not not for everybody. I think that's that's the point. I, I, I uh, there was a study at Croy um, which Raj may mention about thigh injections, and maybe that would be easier to do in, in like a pharmacy or that sort of thing. Um, the problem was that 60% that or more of the folks that um, uh, were in that study actually preferred gluteal injections. They got gluteal injections first, then went to thigh. Mm. The thigh was more painful because it's a big volume. So um, I think it's not for everyone, um, but it is for 10%, 15 yeah. I don't know. Trip. Yeah, I would just take a step back and say this is our first proven long-acting regimen, but long-acting two months is not that long-acting, and that's what we've discovered. What I tried to highlight in my talk is that there's a lot of other options coming. None are proven yet. So this is the first foray into all injectable therapy, and like our first foray into any other class you want to mention, some of those drugs had problems and eventually better drugs came along, which made things much easier. I think that's where we are right now. So we're trying to not sell, we're just offering options to people and that's the key thing, right? People want options and if you give them options, um, that will perhaps enforce it or, or support in here adherence better. So this, uh, I agree with Joe, this certainly isn't for everybody, but it's a nice option for some people 
And I think we can just be happy to know that things are going to get better in our field with long acting. Our first in the room question. Uh, Mike Senchin, um, is this on? Yep. Can you hear? Yeah. So um, this is for Joe. When you were in going to the patient that had the complicated regimen that was virologically suppressed and we were thinking of different options, you did mention, you know, BF TAF, and there was a there was a just a handful of people that said that alone they'd be comfortable with. And then you, you yourself talked about well, you would be comfortable giving Fostem severe, but you particularly said, but that would be a BID drug. And since we're talking about off-label use of drugs, certainly BF TAF would be off-label for somebody that had nuke resistance. But um, the fa it's my understanding the phase two B studies with Fostem severe, and and Charlie's here, and he. It, we want to know if he, I think he's here. Um, the phase 2B studies looked at 1,200 milligrams once a day when BMS was developing the drug. And from an efficacy standpoint, it was on parity, but the concern is QT prolongation at doses of 2,400 milligrams BID, and our current dosing is 600 BID. And because it's a substrate of CYP3A, the thought was that by the time we use Fostem severe in highly treatment experienced patients, everybody would be on a booster. And if you use 1,200 milligrams once a day, that would put the peak levels up at the concerning levels of QT prolongation. But in the absence of a booster, one, once a day dosing, 1,200 milligrams a day, there we go, is, um, is something that I think would be plausible and you know, an off-label use, but certainly something we could do. Yeah, you, you just increased my knowledge base, so, so um, <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, that sounds quite logical to me. Um, it's certainly way off-label, and, and um, y you could potentially do it twice daily first. I, I mean, honestly, BF-TAF should work in that patient. It, it, that should be enough, or dalutegavir taf FTC. Uh, it just, I, I don't know, we, we all have anxiety about, uh, you know, treatment, um, you know, and someone has limited options. But y you made really good points. I don't have anything to add to it. But the other thing I would say is that our patients are anxious about this, too. And you sure. really got to bring the patient into the, the discussion. Someone like the one you uh, presented who's been undetectable on an awkward regimen for many, many years, many people just don't want to switch. And your guy wanted to switch, but many others don't want to switch. So we, when we bring that discussion up, we got to include the patient saying, there's a risk if I switch into this that you could have virologic breakthrough. Or with Mike Sensian's suggestion, QT prolongation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do think people that have been suppressed for 15 years have, have a different risk. But, but your, your point's well taken. I certainly am not switching people. You know. You know, I, I have a patient almost identical to the one that we, we talked about, and, and you know, he's, it's almost impossible to get his cholesterol uh, in, under control. He, he is, um, you know, recently had a stroke, and, and he doesn't want to switch. Um, and I, I'm trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. We all had a lot of people who are on AZT3TC for, yep. and a third drug for years who didn't want to switch, and finally, you know, you had to convince them. Yep. Um, so that's another thing about Opman is that the audience is so experienced that they ask these naive questions like Michael just asked. <laughs> Next. Hi. Thank you so much, first of all, for the great presentations. Um, this is more geared towards um, the patient that we were talking about with maybe like that low-level resistance to ropivirine. No offense to ropivirine, but it's a little bit wimpy. Um, but at the same time, if that patient were particularly asking for an all-injectable regimen. I wanted to hear the panel's thoughts on the use of the combination of cabral, piverine, and potentially lenacapavir. I know that there's been no studies, per se, that I know of um, using lenacapavir in switch studies for patients who are virally suppressed. But if there are, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So if someone has low-level real piverine resistance, you don't want to use the all-injectable regimen. Right, that was the, Joe showed you the chart, that was the biggest risk factor for subsequent virologic failure. The suggestion that you could replace it with lenacapavir or add it to lenacapavir simply hasn't been studied yet. 
Yeah, people are do, people are talking about it. Um, certainly, um, I, yeah, I work with David Wall, who who I'm sure would wear a cowboy hat and boots if he could. Um, and, and he's definitely, you know, he has several patients in mind for that. Now, whether you can get the drug or not, you know, it would be way, way off label. Whether it would work or not, you know, it's, I think one of the things that, that Tripp showed us from the, I always get Calibrate and Capella mixed up, but from the Calibrate study, that, that's one of the first studies where they took people uh, and removed the nukes, right? So, so they actually have... Um, uh, Bic Tegavir with lenacapavir maintaining suppression, so an integrase and a capsid, which, th so that's kind of new data in there um, that sustains suppression. There was, I think, one failure in that arm, and I don't remember when it occurred, whether it occurred bef uh, during suppression or during, uh, during um, the, uh, when the virus was becoming suppressed or when it was suppressed. So, so I mean, that study, Calibrate, is really kind of the companies lead in to see whether you can stay suppressed with integrase and capsid. Uh, uh, and so that's kind of what you're asking, right? And you have to throw in the ropivirine because you can't, I, I assume you can't get cabotegavir, or I'm going to say a trade name, apritude, to give to someone with infection. So you would have to give, um, I guess. So, so I get your question. It's sophisticated. Uh, is way off label, like you know, like the, you know, like the labels here. You're over there. Um, uh, so um, and the company's going to, the prior authorization is going to totally pick up on that. So right. it's going to be a battle yeah. to try that strategy. Yeah. So, so this notion of way, way, way off label is like Broadway, right? You can be way <laughs> off, off Broadway. And, uh, yeah. And yeah, this so is a new. I'm going to go to uh, Paul Aaron's question, who usually is here. He's uh, long time uh, offender here at this meeting, at, uh, hi Paul. Uh, and he wants to know about a treatment experience switch. You went through a lot of the details there. And it's kind of hard to decide sometimes, but does cost ever come into the picture? Do you consider that? And how do you know? Is it, there's, a, there's an average wholesale price, but you don't know what the actual payment is, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's an issue. It's come up several times for me where, um, you know, uh, and, and it gets even more complicated when your patient turns 65, because then it's like with the Wild West. And a lot of my patients are over 65. But, um, um, you know, I've had tr what I thought was simplifying, and then the, their insurance company insists that it be generic lamivudine. Uh, and then they have a copay that they didn't have before that they can't afford, even though it's a modest copay. So it is really, we're very lucky. We have something, uh, uh, our, something called shared services at UNC, and they'll actually run prescriptions without actually um, submitting them. Oh. We can see what the consequences are. Even if the person has to use you know, CVS Specialty or Optum mm -hmm. or whatever, they'll run it for us so we can see what the consequences are. But that is a big issue. It, yeah. whoever, that, that's obviously a very so, another sophisticated provider asking us. And it, it seems like with regard to, we don't know what broadly neutralizing antibodies are going to cost, but I think that the cost goes up exponentially as you can't say the name of the drug. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you stumble over the name, the cost just doubled. They're going to be really expensive. <laughs> so I want to thank you for, for the lead, because because I was hoping Tripp would say this, but I, the reason I work so hard to pronounce those names is because I felt if I said Zab, Tab, and a Jab, I would be like Dr. Seuss. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are a little bit like Dr. Seuss, yeah, and that's so, a good thing. So I couldn't do that. <laughs> we can take a red pill, blue pill. Right, yeah, yeah right, yeah. <laughs> Bob from Tampa. Yes. Thank you again for the uh, lectures. Although I think the injectables are really great options for the patients, the cabotegravir and apertude, as a solo practitioner who doesn't have a pharmacist, a case manager, and only one nurse, having staff handle the logistics is a nightmare. Um, we have assigned one person to do that for us. The, the, cha the challenges of getting prior authorization, making sure the drug is there on time, making sure that the patient's got their blood work done, um, the, the employee that I asked to do it just asked me to stop. Um, so wow. if you're in solo practice, you've got to have a dedicated employee able to handle it. Yeah, it's a really good point. And you, we've all had this discussion with people, right? They're fully suppressed and they come see you every six months. And they're so happy about that. And then you say, no, but for this all injectable, you've got to come back every two months. That stops the conversation in a lot of people, I think. Is anybody in the room 
seeing their suppressed patients once a year? Every now and then, they live a long way away. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they make that choice for yeah, us. Yeah, no, no, no. It, oh. It's uncomfortable, yeah. though, isn't it? I mean, we're so conditioned. It was, it was a big stretch to go from three to four months and then four to six months. We kind of got comfortable with I that. I mean, these therapies are so safe. You know, you have a 30-year-old that has no other medical problems, you know, on, you know, either two drugs or three drugs, um, <laughs> a pill a day. I, I just saw a guy who hadn't seen me for a year and a half, and I said, you know, there's some risk here because we need to check your labs. And, and I checked his labs. They were all completely normal. Right, and right. he said, <laughs> <laughs> they're normal. <laughs> but, but I think the concern is, even at six months sometimes, but for, certain for a year, is that if for whatever reason somebody's been falling on and off the wagon? No, and no, I'm not recommending that for, broadly. That would be a mistake. But but um, it's yeah. off label. Is that what you're saying? It's off label. It's it's not it's in, New Jersey. It's in New Jersey. Oh. <laughs> I see. Okay, everything's legal there. Uh, so Catherine Goldman asks about BMI and people over 40 with getting injection, cabotegravir, and ropivirine. What do we know about the PK and fat deposition and that type of thing? Yeah, it, those are really, really important questions. I mean, the, the, the bigger the BMI, the, the, it, you know, there isn't a, a, a weak association between BMI and, 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 and treatment failure. It's pretty weak, though. That um, was on the chart, Yeah, right, that's on the, the chart, right. Yeah, it was a factor. But, but the issue is, to one, to make sure you use the correct needle. You, you need to use at least the two-inch needle to, to get it in the right place. So I think that's really important. Um, there, you know, like I said, you know, these, the companies, no offense to the back, um, you know, present these studies kind of over and over, and they certainly have shown cabotegravirine in people over 50. It might have been over 60. I can't remember at one of the recent meetings, and it seems to work fine. So, but as people develop sarcopenia um, uh, and get older, there's going to be um, probably more, more risk, and and there's rarely these kind of injection mishaps where, where they get too close to a, a, a blood vessel and, and you get high levels, and the, but that seems to be really rare. Um, but I, I think those are, those are real, real concerns. I, I mean, to me, the mystery is why do people who get it on time and their, uh, uh, you know, their, their concentrations seem adequate, maybe they're a little bit below the median, but they seem pretty adequate, why do they not succeed? And that, um, is, is a, still remains a mystery. But I, I agree, those are BMI. We started someone recently with a BMI of 50, and um, I don't think it worked out. So I, you know, and I think it has to do with the injection technique and how difficult it is. Yeah, so I, think, I, I don't know if Rafi's here yet, but maybe he's going to comment on this. This was also Rafe, seen in, Rafi, you're here? Yeah. I can't. So I'll, maybe you're going to talk about this, about why there are cab prep injection failures injectable prep as well. He says yeah. yes. Well, yeah. well we're so going to hear from Rafi in just a little bit. So it's good to see you. Um, it's good that he's well, here. Joe, Welcome. I, Mike, if we have one more second. So, there was this presentation from the French group that looked at and found BMI was a risk factor for failure on injectable cab and went as far as to say that maybe we shouldn't do the direct to inject in that group, which. Yeah, yeah that, that was a tough presentation to understand. So here's a, um, a question just about uh, in, in the face of integrase inhibitor resistant that Hannah Whiteside sent in, uh, about the differences of using Bictegravir once daily, which you kind of have to do, versus Dolutegravir twice daily. And I know there's nuances about how many mutations are there and which one is 155, 148, whatever. But how do you make the decision about when you would need the twice daily dietegravir. Are you gonna take that trip? I mean, the first way it was used were people that were failing the first generation integrase inhibitors. So people failing RAL or LV, you could rescue them by doubling the dose, or it probably had more to do with which mutations they had selected out, but the double dose was recommended. Now we typically use double dose depending on drug-drug interactions, um, particularly rifampin being the obvious one. So other than that, I'm not sure there's a reason to double the dose. 
Joe has other ideas. No, no, no. I, I think that it was, it's, whatever they did, the echo is a little bit tough. Um, I, I think they were asking if there is integrase resistance, should you ever use Bictegravir? Uh, I think that was kind of the question. Is, is that, that the question? Yeah. Is that ah, right? Okay. So, so my answer to that is no. Because uh, I, I, if you have, you know, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of subtlety here, but if you have the combination of mutations that looks like dolutegravir twice daily would still be active, I would be very concerned about uh, using once day bictegravir. Because if you end up with high level integrase resistance, you're down a path of, of um, uh, and, and Tripp is very optimistic about new drugs. Personally, I'm a slightly less optimistic about new drugs. Um, because uh, um, uh, they keep falling by the wayside, but um, uh, anyway, that, that I would use, if someone has integrase resistance and it looks like an in, a second generation will have activity, I would use twice daily. So Tripp, I wanted to come back to, I thought one of the really intriguing things you referred to with, with the BNABs about the vaccine effect, which in essence, I heard you right, in some way sort of increases the um, immune system responses, almost like, I'm guessing like an adjuvant, I made that up. But, but I've also was flashing to the, how many people we give IVIG to uh, who have overactive immune systems and it seems to calm it down uh, by the FC receptor or some hand-waving mechanism. So how do you, give us like a 30 second orientation to what you think that means, this immune vaccination thing. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear what Joe thinks about this too, but I think it's the BNAP binding to HIV and then changing it and making it more recognizable to the immune system uh, is what's going on. So antivirals don't do that, right? Even the ones that bind HIV. I see. There's just stopping it. So it's for it. the HIV specific immunity, not just generalized immunity. That's exactly right. Yeah, I, I, I think Trip is, totally on target with that. Um, I do think that um, there's evidence that perhaps you'll see that best when the people who are viremic are given these antibodies and whether people who are, you know, very suppressed and you give the antibodies, whether you'll see a vaccinal effect or not, I think is debated for that exact reason, what, what Tripp just said. Um, the one oral agent that might actually lead to some change in immunologic response is fostemsevir. For that same reason, changing antibody, uh, changing envelope confirmation, and potentially exposing epitopes that weren't previously visible. And we should say this is more of an idea. Oh yeah, that, right, right. Yes, this is definitely an idea that, that's being right. looked hypothesis. at right now. Yeah, it's hypothesis. a it's hypothesis. intriguing hypothesis, hypothesis but right. definitely not proven. So, Michael, I may ask if you don't mind if we could hold that your question till the panel Q and A as we get into the cases, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody for wonderful questions and participation. For those of you uh, on Zoom, not in the room here, I have a number for tech support. If you're having difficulty, I guess if you're having difficulty getting online, you can't hear this message, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. <laughs> but in the future, <laughs> dial 765, write this down, 765 633 Four seven four nine six three three four seven four nine, and we'll try to put that in the uh, chat portion of the Zoom, so you'll have that handy, assuming you can get to it. Okay, thanks, guys. Wonderful wow. discussion. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Okay, we're going to move on to Dr. Raj Gandhi, who um, is a the chair of the IAS USA guidelines. So we have the chairs from each of the major guidelines here. It's a wonderful faculty as always. Uh, and as you can see here, he's from Mass General and Harvard Medical School. Um, and he's gonna basically give us the Thomas Jefferson opening of Act Two of Hamilton. <laughs> what did I miss? So what's up from Post Croy? Thank you. Unlike Mike, I don't think I can sing uh, my presentation, but um, if you get Mike on a good day, he will definitely sing his presentation. So we're going to uh, go through post-conference updates from CORI 2023. And I'm going to say at the outset that there will be a little bit of overlap from what you've heard. And what I'll do is uh, be a bit briefer on some of those presentations and give my perspective on, on some of them as well. 
uh, but we'll cover a, a number of uh, new topics uh, in the next 25 minutes. So here are the things we're going to uh, discuss. I took these as the hot topics from CROI 2023. We'll talk about current ART, and we'll stress a bit about the new guidelines around HIV and pregnancy, because I think there are some important things to really um, focus on on HIV and pregnancy. We'll spend a little bit of time, but less so on new ART, because we just heard a good um, discussion of that. We'll spend uh, time on co-infections and comorbidities, and I'll finish up with COVID-19 advances. What I won't touch on here is HIV prevention and pre-exposure prophylaxis and a really important study of the Mosaic Go study, a vaccine study that will be covered later this morning. So here we go. Current ART. I actually want to start with um, a guideline that was uh, put out by the DHHS at the end of January, but there was a special session at CROI that, that went over this as well as another aspect of the guidelines, which is infant feeding, and I think this is really important to, to um, uh, emphasize. So here are the DHHS guidelines for what to start in someone who's treatment naive during pregnancy. If you uh, look at the um, integrase inhibitor class, you now see dolutegravir is a solo drug that is with nucleosides, but no more raltegravir, and I'm going to come back to that. And this is based on the fact that um, the latest data from the Sapamo study, which initially raised the concern around neural tube defects, has essentially been reassuring. For the protease inhibitor class now, there's only a single protease inhibitor recommended in this, in this cocktail. It's a boosted darunavir, ritonavir boosted darunavir to be specific. Adizanavir now has been relegated to an alternative class. This should be coupled with two nucleoside RT inhibitors. You see the choices there. For initiation of therapy, uh, the DHHS guidelines are not yet to the point of recommending two drug therapy. Here are the drugs for which the DHHS finds insufficient data, um, but um, there are instances where you might continue uh, a Bictegravir, TAF, FTC, Bictegravir, TDF, FTC, uh, Bictegravir, uh, Dolutegravir, uh, TDF, FTC regimen. Um, and uh, there are then regimens that you should absolutely not use, and these are ones that are cobacistat boosted because of PK concerns, and then the two drug regimens that are listed here. The IAS USA, um, as Joe mentioned, has come down on favoring dolutegravir plus TAF FTC as a preferred regimen, and that's largely based on the IMPACT 2010 study, which showed better pregnancy outcomes as well as better infant outcomes in, infant, in uh, individuals who got that particular regimen. Um, here are the major changes that weren't in that first slide, but these are now back to the DHS. I alluded to this already, but raltegravir and boosted adizanavir are now considered alternatives. And then if a person is on a regimen with insufficient data, bictegravir, deravirin, you essentially have two, I think, reasonable options. One is to continue uh, with frequent viral load monitoring or have a discussion around switching to a recommended regimen. And I think that essentially depends on the particulars of the patient in front of you and, and what their risk tolerance is and what um, the concerns are about losing control during pregnancy. The next point, though, I has not yet been brought up, and a special session at CROI really made this point. Back in 2020, when the infant guidelines, infant feeding guidelines were first um, brought out by the DHHS, this issue of um, breastfeeding was not um, uh, there's been a change, essentially, since 2020 in terms of our thinking about uh, the guidelines thinking about breastfeeding. So these are the things that were stressed, and I want to um, emphasize these. So counseling people that formula eliminates HIV transmission. Viral suppression on ART decreases the transmission risk to less than 1%, but not zero. Now, I will pause here and say that Rebecca Zosh, um, who's at BI Deaconess, gave a very nice presentation on what is the residual risk in a person who's suppressed uh, in terms of breastfeeding. Most of the studies come from Africa. Most of the studies are um, women who start during pregnancy as opposed to being on ART prior to pregnancy, which is the preferred uh, way you want, to, you want to do prenatal counseling and have someone on ART before they become pregnant, if possible. And, and most of the risk is well under 1%, very, very rare. The second bullet I want to underline Individuals on ART with sustained, undetectable viral loads who either choose to breastfeed or formula feed should be supported in the decision. And essentially, that is a substantial change from the last iteration of the guidelines. And the last point is, is unambiguous, I would say. There have been instances in which child protective services have been um, engaged, and that's uh, completely not appropriate. So let me um, move on from pregnancy. There has, I would say, in the last five years, been a revolution in our understanding of how resistance works. And, and Joe mentioned some of this, but I'm going to uh, mention 
one new study, and I'm going to reiterate one prior study. I'm going to start with Nadia. So the studies that we're going to talk about here are not in suppressed people. This is kind of the highest barrier. This is the, the biggest hurdle to cross. This is someone who's viremic. And in Nadia, people were failing at NNRTI, done in sub-Saharan Africa, where because of uh, less frequent viral load monitoring, a lot of resistance is present, and you'll see that in a moment. In Nadia, people were randomized to receive either dolutegravir or boosted darunavir with either TDF3TC or AZT3TC. I'm going to put aside the AZT arm. That did less well, and I think that is essentially the death knell of, uh, for AZT. Study participants in Nadia, um, 60, uh, K65R, the tenofovir resistance mutation, present in 50% of people, M184PV in over 85% of people. The graph on the right shows you the results. Essentially, dolutegravir plus two nucleosides was non-inferior to boosted darunavir plus two nucleosides with high rates of suppression, close to 90% in, in, the, in, both, in both of those groups. I will mention that nine participants, that's 4% of individuals who got dolutegravir plus two nucleosides, developed resistance, and you saw some of that in the, in the prior talk. There was no resistance in the boosted darunavir group. The study that was new at CROI is a study that I'm still trying to figure out how to say. I think D2F, or D, uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure out how to say that, but that's the, the, what it stands for is on that slide. This is a Nadia-like study, okay? So similar population, people who are failing NNRTI, so they're viremic, and again, this is a tougher barrier than people who are suppressed. It had two different stages, and this is because the study essentially was modified during the course of its, of, of, of course of its evolution. The first stage was boosted darunavir plus two nucleosides, which is what they called standard of care, versus a nuke-sparing regimen, dolutegravir plus boosted darunavir. So this is our first data, I would say, on dolutegravir with boosted darunavir in the viremic population. We've seen data on suppressed people with that regimen, but now we're seeing it in viremic populations. They modified the study in, the, in stage two to add another arm. They added a dolutegravir plus TDF-XTC arm. Now, a really important point here is in the darunavir arm, there was a lot of AZT use. 76% of individuals were, the nucleosides that were chosen was, a, was AZT. And that was substantially greater than in the, in the group that got um, uh, dolutegravir. So when people were getting darunavir, a lot more AZT use, and therefore I would say the corresponding toxicities of AZT. 831 people were enrolled, and essentially the finding was the following. Dolutegravir plus boosted darunavir was superior to uh, du um, boosted darunavir plus two nucleosides and was non-inferior to dolutegravir plus tenofovir XTC. Now, what we don't yet know is the resistance data. Um, th these data will come, but we don't know that yet. And I would wonder if the reason why dolutegravir plus boosted darunavir was better than boosted darunavir plus two nucleosides is because those nucleosides often included AZT. And I think that's when you're getting uh, people having trouble staying on a regimen. So again, something we can come back to during the discussion. But I think what I take away from this is in a situation where you really need to avoid the nucleosides and someone is viremic, this is a regimen that has legs. This is a regimen that should work. So there have been a lot of studies, and I'm going to try to take away some of the lessons that we've learned over the last four or five years um, from not just this year's CROI, but from the last couple of years' CROI. So the first lesson is, in a treatment experienced person with viral suppression, if they're virologically suppressed on a boosted PI, if you switch them to two nucleosides and dolutegravir, you will maintain viral suppression, even if you don't know the resistance results. This was a study done in Sub-Saharan Africa called 2SD. And essentially, if you have a high a barrier um, uh, drug like dolutegravir, you can keep people suppressed. The second lesson, so we're kind of going up in terms of how hard it is to, to get someone suppressed. So the first one is someone who's already virologically suppressed. The next level is if you've got someone who's virologically suppressed and their virus is sensitive to an integrase inhibitor and sensitive to PIs, switching to tenofovir XTC plus a high barrier resistance drug like either dolutegravir, bictegravir, or boosted darunavir is likely to maintain viral suppression even if there's pre-existing pre nucleoside RT and, and nuke resistance. Now, I agree that the more nuke resistance there is, the more nervous I get. But um, so this is, you, you do have to customize this to this specific person, but that is one of the lessons of the, of the recent studies. 
And then the last, and this is the hardest to get suppressed, is someone who's got virologic failure with, with nucleoside resistance. This is the Nadia population. This is the two, D2F population. But their virus is PI and integrase sensitive. You've got a couple of reasonable options. You can use boosted darunavir plus two nucleosides. You could use dalutegavir plus boosted uh, darunavir. Or you could use dalutegavir plus two nucleosides, although there is a small risk of dalutegavir resistance. And then you have to kind of do the trade off of are you going to be able to monitor them? What are the consequences of resistance? And so this, this is something we can also come back to in the discussion. OK, we're going to um, do a couple of really short takes and some other um, headlines. Um, Joe already showed you the results of the solar study. Um, you've seen that uh, people who are virologically suppressed, the Bactegavir FTC step, uh, TAP, if you switch them to Cabotegavir or that's non-inferior to continuing their oral regimen. He already mentioned the, the three people who had confirmed virologic failure, two with resistance. I think someone asked about um, uh, BMI. Um, in this particular study, solar, the median changes in weight, BMI, and body composition was similar in the two groups, the group that stayed on the Bactegavir FTC tap, the group that switched to Cabotegavir Rilpivirin. We were talking a lot about um, injections just now, um, especially in people with high BMIs. There was an interesting study of, uh, I think, a little over 100 people now who got the injections of cabotegavir recovery not in the gluteus medius, but in the thigh. This was done by healthcare professionals, so it was not self-administered. This is not like that PCSK9 you know, drug for cholesterol, which is a little pen where you can inject it. This is still healthcare administered, but adequate drug levels, although there were a few instances where the drug levels were, were too high, probably because of that, where it was given. And, um, and then there was high rates of viral suppression. Interestingly, in, when they looked at preference, people still actually preferred the gluteus medius injection rather than the thigh injection. And then this study, um, I'm going to go through it just a little bit more detail from Ward 86 presented by Monica Gandhi. I want to stress one point on this. You've seen this data already. Um, this was a group of individuals who were in a very vulnerable population in this urban clinic. They didn't have any mutations to begin with. They didn't have ropivirine or integrase mutations. And they were willing to come to clinic every four weeks, and they had good contact information. So it was a very vulnerable population. You see who was in it there. So two-thirds non-white, two-thirds unstably housed, a third with current ongoing substance use, and about 57 individuals, not about, but exactly 57 individuals who had viremia. Three quarters of the time, there was on-time injection, and you saw the 97.5% um, uh, HIV suppression. The median follow-up in this study is about six months. It took about a, a month to get suppressed, and the median follow-up in this report is about six months. And you've heard already about the two people who developed some resistance. And, and um, I think this will be a topic of discussion, not just now, but going forward. OK, so um, we heard a great talk on uh, where to next, so I'll be briefer on this. Um, uh, you've heard uh, data on uh, Islatravir. You've heard data on Lenacapavir. I'll just uh, reiterate and, and perhaps go through this more briefly, because you've heard the details. Essentially, where we're at is that um, the data with a, what I'm going to call an intermediate dose of Islatravir, that was that 0 0.75 milligram. If you give deravirine plus an intermediate dose of Islatravir, the phase three trials that you've heard about from TRIP shows that that's non-inferior to continuing three or four drug ART or continuing Bactegavir FTC TAP. You've heard a lot of details about the dose-dependent decrease in the total lymphocyte count and CD4 count. And essentially where we're at right now is two trials that are ongoing. One is giving a, what I'm going to call a low dose, lower dose of Islatravir, the same dose that you saw some data on which is a 0 0.5 milligram dose with deravirine, or this once weekly dosing of Islatravir at a higher dose once weekly with lenacapavir. I think if these studies show um, uh, efficacy, then I think this is going to be a regimen that we're going to be using. And you've also heard about lenacapavir, so I won't uh, go through this again. I will say what I took away from this study that Joe presented on we all have to practice tiropavimab and zindlervimab. I, I think I did less well than Tripp did. <laughs> um, what I took away from this is that, um, so lenacapavir was given subcutaneously. The antibodies were given um, intravenously. A, a couple of things I want to say here. Um, when they screened for this study, they screened a little over um, 100 and, 
I think it was about 114 people or so, 45% of those people had virus that was susceptible to both BNABs. So that was one of the criteria. To get into the study, you had to have virus that was susceptible to both of the BNABs. And clade B virus, the virus that we have in the United States, about half of the time uh, will be susceptible to both antibodies. And then you saw the results already. I, I think um, one of the, what I'm excited about with this is the uh, option for every six month dosing if the phase two and then phase three study bear it out. But I think we do have to keep in mind that this won't be for everyone because not everyone's virus is going to be susceptible to, to two BNABs. As to whether it would have worked with one BNAB, I think that's a topic that uh, needs more um, investigation. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears completely away from ART and go over to co-infection co and comorbidities. You're going to hear later today about what I think was, as Mike said, some of the most interesting data from CROI. These are the DOXY-PEP studies. Um, Dr. Muzni is going to go through this in, in uh, um, detail, and she will um, cover all of these. I just want to point out on a single slide the headlines from three studies. There are now three studies showing that giving doxycycline after uh, sexual exposure within one to three days does prevent a variety of STIs. The first of these was from France. The second of these done in, um, uh, presented last year in 2022. And then the third was presented at this particular meeting, and you'll hear the de details. And each of those three studies, it was done in MSM or in transgender women. At this meeting, we heard the disappointing results of a, a study done in cisgender women in Africa where there was no difference in incident STIs. And again, this will be a topic of, of greater discussion. And you'll also hear some data on antimicrobial resistance, Thus far, not a major effect seen on the microbiome, not a major effect seen on resistance, but something to monitor. Okay, over to MPOX. So MPOX, um, there was a study that really convinced me that MPOX in people with advanced HIV is an opportunistic condition. This is a study presented by Chloe Orkin. It's a case series. It was done in the Americas, uh, Europe, and Asia. Most of the patients in this case series were from South America and North America, some from Europe, few from Africa. So let me take a step back. MPOX in people with well-controlled HIV, high CD4 counts on antiviral therapy, MPOX in people with HIV seems to be similar to MPOX in people without HIV. And, and the same group has shown us data supporting that. Now, though, they're turning their attention to people with advanced HIV, people whose CD4 count is less than 350. So they had a 382 people who were living with HIV, CD4 count less than 350. And the startling figure, the figure that got, I think, everyone's attention is that in people with HIV and a CD4 count less than 200, the mortality was 15%. Now, it broke down somewhat on whether they were virologically suppressed or not, but mortality of 15%. And you can look at those CD4 count strata in the graphic, and you can see that in the most advanced HIV, you have the highest mortality. The variety of complications they saw were also startling. They saw people who had respiratory complications, including respiratory failure and pulmonary nodules. You're seeing a CT from someone with advanced uh, HIV and MPOX. They saw instances of um, large necrotizing confluent skin lesions, some examples here. Bacterial infections were common, including sepsis, and then CNS complications, including confusion and encephalitis. Now, of these 382 people, 85 of them were initiated on ART or reinitiated on ART. And out of those 85, 21 of them had what they thought was an iris event, an immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome event. And among those 21 who had what they thought was iris, 57% um, of them, 12 of them actually died. Um, now, I want to uh, underline a point here as well. ART was started in these 85 people a median of 21 days after MPOX um, symptom onset, and in some instances, many months after MPOX symptom onset. So what I take this to mean is that you can get to a point of no return with MPOX. That is, if ART is started too late, then your mortality is going to be very high. We don't know when is the optimal time to start ART, but I would still, in the absence of more data, start it as early as you can, uh, just so it doesn't progress to this level. A couple of other short takes. We've heard a lot about uh, weight gain already. There was a study uh, called Characterize, which is spelled with an S because it is from South Africa. This supports what you heard earlier. This was looking at the advanced study, and people who were in that study who were on dolutegravir plus TAF FTC, when they switched to dolutegravir TDF FTC among women, they actually lost weight. 
and among those who were receiving efavirenz plus TDF-FTC, when they switched to dolutegravir TDF-FTC, they actually gained weight. So that supports what Joe was um, proposing before, is that TDF and efavirenz each have weight suppressive effects. There was also a study, and now we're on to um, another, co another infection. This is a study that was published in the New England Journal recently called Truncate TB. Some additional data came out at CROI, and I want to stress these new data. This was an eight-week bedaquiline linazolid-based regimen with INH, PZA, and ethambutol for TB compared to a standard six-month regimen. The headline in the and the paper is that it was non-inferior as a strategy to six-month therapy, but there are important caveats, and I would say this is not ready for prime time. There was a high relapse rate with the short course, and there is residual concern that bedaquiline, one of the drugs in this regimen, has a very long half-life, and there could be resistance engendered. So I would say a step in the right direction, but not the regimen that I, would, uh, that I think we'll end up with. Um, two slides on reservoirs on cure research. Um, I was involved with a study with the ACTG looking at what happens to the reservoir now over two decades of antiretroviral therapy. And there was also a study from Bob Silicano um, on the similar topic. Essentially what we saw in the ACTG is that intact proviruses, those are the proviruses that lead to viral rebound when you stop ART, they decline fairly rapidly in the first decade of ART, but then there's a flattening out of the curve in terms of that second decade of ART, intact proviruses begin to slow down in their decline. And in a couple of instances, you'll actually see an increase in intact proviruses. Bob Silicano, using a virus outgrowth assay, also showed that there was two phases of the decline, a more rapid phase, not very rapid, but a more rapid phase in the first decade, and then a flattening out over a longer duration. I think what's going on with the reservoir is that Intact proviruses may be shifting into more quiescent parts of the genome. That makes them less likely to decay. And there may be, and these are not mutually exclusive, exclusive, there may actually be proliferation of some clones of infected HIV-positive cells. So more information to come on how the reservoir transforms over the course of ART. Um, uh, as in many recent CROIs, um, uh, there was, at this instance, a publication of another HIV cure. There's been a number of these now. I won't belabor this in great detail, but this is a publication of a uh, patient called the Dusseldorf patient, a man in his 50s who uh, had leukemia, received a, uh, a donation, a, a stem cell donation from someone with a delta-32 um, deletion, also got donor lymphocyte infusions. Like many of these cases, graft-versus-host disease was important. Um, traces of HIV DNA was present, but no culturable DNA. And five years after the transplant, he stopped his ART with no rebound of plasma viremia. I want to um, uh, underline the last bullet here, and I think this is interesting. There was no evidence for elevated inflammation in this person in either the lymphoid or gut tissue or evidence of immune activation. Obviously, if you cure or if you control the reservoir, but there's residual inflammation, you haven't yet gotten someone back to the health that you want. And here, at least, this was reassuring that there was no evidence of excess inflammation. OK, I'm going to finish up in the last couple of minutes with COVID-19 advances. Um, we saw at this meeting uh, the results of a uh, study called Scorpio SR. This is a, a new protease inhibitor, a SARS-CoV-2 protease inhibitor that's approved in, for emergency use in Japan. It's a drug called Encetravir. This, was, this is a randomized placebo-controlled trial done largely in Asia, where the drug was given for five days for people who had mild to moderate COVID-19. So they were between the ages of 12 and 69. They had risk factors for progression, and they were within five days of symptom onset. This was a, a young group. It was a median age of uh, mid-30s. 92% of them were vaccinated. There were two different doses of the drug studied. And the main result that was presented is that the Encetravir group had a shorter duration of symptoms by about a day and more rapid clearance of virus. So if you looked at the virology, it very much supported the idea that this particular drug was lowering viral loads more rapidly than people who got the placebo. The, the part that I think got a lot of attention that we still need to uh, see more data on is that there was a suggestion of reduced risk of long COVID symptoms in a post-hoc analysis with Encetravir. So I think more to come. Now I will um, editorialize here for a minute. Um, we all know that nematravir ritonavir has the trouble with drug-drug interactions with the ritonavir portion. Encetravir is not a pharmacologically boosted P53 
PI, but it too has a plethora of different drug-drug interactions. It also has a longer half-life than nematravir. So even though I think one of the advantages would be that there's no ritonavir, it's not going to get us out of the woods when it comes to drug-drug interactions. There are a lot of drug interactions. The ACTG is doing a study of this in, um, in the US, so keep your eye on this particular drug. The other study I wanted to highlight was a study um, presented out of the ACTG that looks at rates of symptom and viral load rebound in untreated patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. I'm going to come back to uh, nematravir, ritonavir. I'll use a trade name for a second, Paxlovid. Um, so this is a study where people got no treatment at all. They actually got placebo in ACTG studies, about 560 people. Fully a quarter of people who got placebo had symptom rebound. So symptom rebound was, um, wasn't the rule, but it certainly was very, very common, 25% uh, or so, one in four. Viral rebound, and these people were sampled very, very frequently, was about one in eight people had viral rebound. So one in four symptom rebound, one in eight had um, viral rebound. If you look at the two together, that's that kind of intersection of the Venn diagram, only 3% had both, um, symptom rebound and high-level viral rebound. This is the point that I learned from the presentation. Most symptom and viral rebound events in this particular study were very transient. About 90% of symptom rebound and 95% of viral rebounds were only at a single time point. So these rebounds occur, they occur frequently. Having both symptom and viral rebound together is uncommon. But when you have it, they're usually fairly short-lived. So I'm going to summarize, um, because this is a topic that comes up all the time for all of us, either with our patients or for ourselves. What do we know about uh, nematavir ritonavir rebound? So there's a wide range in reported frequency of rebound after nematavir ritonavir. Some, but not all, studies suggest symptomatic rebound may be slightly more frequent with nematavir ritonavir than after no treatment, at least numerically so, not always significantly so. What we also know is that some patients with rebound do have high SARS-CoV-2 levels. In some instances, they're culture positive, and it suggests that they might be infectious, although that's not um, definitive. Uh, thus far, no resistance has been detected before or after nematavir, ritonavir, and it doesn't seem to be an immune deficit. There, the data we have thus far doesn't show a, a decrement in antibody levels, a decrement in adaptive immunity. And I think the last point is true. Most of these cases are mild, and most of these cases resolve quickly. So my own thinking is essentially, I counsel patients that rebound may occur, but it's not likely to be severe. And I don't suggest avoiding therapy because of the potential for rebound. And people who do have symptomatic rebound and whose antigen test turns positive again, I think for now we are uh, needing to counsel them to remain isolated. And then I don't generally extend the duration of therapy or retreat, or retreat the patient, but this is an important area for future study. At the um, FDA advisory committee that happened a couple of days ago for this particular drug, this is a, a study that's ongoing. It should have been done earlier, but a study that's ongoing of, of extending the course in immunosuppressed individuals. So here's my summary. There's new guidance on treating HIV during pregnancy and infant feeding in people with HIV. People with nucleoside resistance often maintain HIV suppression with a high barrier resistance uh, to be, uh, resistance drug like bictegravir, dolutegravir, boosted darunavir, plus tenofovir FTC. Switching from bictegravir uh, FTC TAF to long-acting cabotegravir rapivirin maintains viral suppression in almost all patients, but there are these rare, I would say somewhat unexplained, um, rare instances of virologic failure with resistance. Long-acting cabotegravir, uh, rapivir, and I didn't stress this before, but with wraparound services, um, this particular demonstration project in San Francisco, there was really a, a lot of support given to those patients. That strategy, strategy leads to viral suppression in vulnerable viremic patients, but what will it take to replicate this experience? New drug options, lenacapavir is approved as latrovir is under evaluation. MPOX in people with advanced HIV has severe um, complications. We need to know how to prevent and how to treat, and I can come back to that in the discussion. There was some ticoviramat resistance in the study I mentioned. New insights into HIV reservoirs in people with HIV on two decades of ART. And for COVID, no, don't avoid nematavir, ritonavir because of possible rebound, and keep your eye on encetravir. So I will stop there. Thank you for your attention, and I'll uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Raj. That was great. And uh, a lot of new information at this year's CROI. Um, we've had the privilege of having Charlie Flexner here for almost every one of the opmans. What's fun about 
uh, looking back is that Charlie's kind of kept us ahead of the curve of what's about to happen in HIV therapeutics and in drug development. If you recall, a couple years ago, he started telling us about long acting and then new ways of delivering long acting in terms of implantables and that type of thing. And we're actually seeing that come to fruition in clinical trials or in the animal studies. So this year, to kind of keep us ahead of the curve, we're going to learn a lot about mRNA or RNA itself and what, a, what this revolution is going to mean for us today, but importantly in the future. So Charlie, welcome back. Thanks, Mike, and thanks to you all for being here. It's always a pleasure to be at Opmand. Uh, and now for something completely different. We're going to talk about messenger RNA. So here are my disclosures. And we're going to begin with a little bit of uh, the history of science. So our first audience response question, everybody get ready. What was the date of the first publication reporting injection of messenger RNA for protein expression? Was it 1797, 1897, 1997, 1987, 1990, or are you just completely confused by this question? Okay, there's a bit of a distribution there. Uh, fortunately, most of you uh, did pay attention to the fact that 1797 was not the first mRNA injection. That was, that was Edward Jenner's first publication of smallpox vaccination. So it is tied into this story. But the correct answer is 1990. So here, uh, next slide, please. Here is the first description uh, of in direct to inject messenger RNA carried out in mice. This was published in a Science almost exactly 33 years ago, 33 years ago next week. This is 1990 BC, before Opman. Um, I, 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 heard about, I, I uh, heard about this article at a journal club the first week it came out, and it completely blew my mind. So here's what they did in this experiment. They actually direct, they directly injected messenger RNA for a, a several different reporter genes into mouse muscle. They removed muscle from those animals and stained the muscle to look for expression of the reporter genes. And this is beta-galactosidase. The black is, the, is an antibody to beta-galactosidase in these muscle sections. And what you can see is the minority of muscle cells, but some mus muscle cells uh, express a substantial amount of beta-galactosidase, the, the uh, uh, protein encoded by the gene in the M mRNA that was injected into these mice. So this you know, raises a lot of questions. Why isn't every muscle cell uh, expressing beta-galactosidase? Or maybe more importantly, why are any muscle cells expressing beta-galactosidase? Why on earth would muscle cells contain a transport mechanism to take up messenger RNA? That just seems completely um, inconsistent with everything I learned about biology. But there, it, there you have it. Now, um, uh, uh, one question you may be asking yourself is, everyone in this room has now received a messenger RNA injection into their muscles. Why didn't we do this 33 years ago? Well, that's a very interesting question. So here's the kinetics of expression of reporter genes in um, this uh, mouse experiment, where they also did direct injection of DNA and reported that as a possible new strategy for gene transfer. First of all, <clears throat> first of all you can see in figure A that there is um, a dose response for expression of protein as a, as a function of how much RNA you inject. Uh, but in the middle, in B, if you inject messenger RNA, the length of time of expression is not very long. Uh, after 60 hours, just, three and a, just uh, two and a half days, um, you hardly see any protein being expressed. 
And you may ask yourself, what happens with a COVID vaccine? How long do you express protein? And the answer is we don't know, but it's probably not very long. It's probably like this, only two and a half or three days. Now, if you inject DNA, you express protein for much, much longer than that. In this case, um, more than 60 days. So why aren't we using DNA injections for vaccine delivery? And that's because, you know, there's a small problem with injecting DNA, which, it, which is that it just might get incorporated into your chromosomes, and the anti-vaxxers would have a field day with that. So um, what we know about naked RNA injection for protein expression circa 1990, the doses were huge. 100 micrograms of RNA per mouse as compared to 100 micrograms of, uh, of COVID mRNA per human for the Moderna vaccine and 30 micrograms for the Pfizer vaccine. So um, on a, on a uh, body surface area proportional uh, extrapolation, about 100 times the dose of what we're currently delivering with COVID vaccines. The persistence of protein expression was very short, um, only about two and a half days. And there were studies carried out in the early 1990s with direct injection of naked RNA as a strategy for influenza vaccine. But the results were very disappointing. Poor antibody response and very short-lived immunity. Why? It's because the world is full of enzymes designed to break down RNA. Um, every one of you has RNases on your skin. You have RNases on your coffee cup. You have RNases on your laptop. There's probably RNases on the tablecloths on these tables. So the world is designed to break down RNA probably as a way of preventing exactly what happened in this experiment, taking up foreign RNA and having it expressed in your cells. <clears throat> OK, so what happened? What happened to change all of this? What was the breakthrough? And that brings me to our second audience response question. So here we go. What's the difference between injected naked messenger RNA and the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine? <clears throat> Is it packaging and polyethylene glycol, packaging and polyvinyl chloride polymer, packaging in lipid-based nanoparticles, packaging in anti-RNA antibodies, packaging in an adeno-associated virus AAV vector, or what? But, but the plurality of you got the right answer. It's number three, 40%. That's very impressive, Opman audience. Packaging and lipid-based nanoparticles. Anyone who answered polyethylene glycol, uh, you get partial credit because there actually is also polyethylene glycol in uh, these vaccine particles, but it's mostly the lipid that makes the difference. So here's the a cartoon expressing what we think is happening. Um, the assumption is that these lipid nanoparticles protect the mRNA from all these RNases that are all over the world and allow the uh, RNA to be taken up into a cell where the lipid is broken down by lipases, releasing the messenger RNA, which is transcribed to produce a, an authentic copy of the coronavirus spike protein that gets transported to the cell surface and elicits an antibody response. In truth, we don't know that it actually happens this way because there's also lipase in your blood and there's lipases in lots of other places in your body and it's possible that's what's, what's being taken up by your muscle cells is actually naked RNA like the 1990 experiment, but that's never been proven. Um, this is just a comparison of the composition of the two most advanced COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Uh, at the top is the BioNTech Pfizer. At the bottom is the Moderna. I think the goal of this table, which I don't expect you to, to read, but it's, it will be there after the meeting if you want to look at it. The goal of this table is to show you that these two vaccines are actually quite similar. There are some very minor differences in the excipients, in the, lip, in the lipid nanoparticles in these two vaccines. The structure of the RNA is very similar, and not surprisingly, the consequences of vaccination are also very similar. So what is a nanoparticle? 
Well, fortunately, everyone in this room now knows what a nanoparticle is because most of you have probably been injecting your HIV patients with nanoparticles. Um, in this case, the uh, graph is a cabotegravir nanoparticle. But rather than being a lipid-based nanoparticle containing messenger RNA, this is a nanoparticle composed of nanocrystals of a water-soluble drug, cabotegravir in this case, but the uh, nanoparticles of um, rilpivirine look uh, uh, nearly identical to this. So the, the, the uh, point of, a, of calling something a nanoparticle, it's not magic. It's just a description of the physical size of the particle, and producing something in particles that size um, allows those particles to be taken up uh, in uh, uh, cells where we would like them to go or to form uh, depot, uh, depots for uh, eventual long-term release of a drug, for example. So how do mRNA vaccines work? Um, uh, we are now going to our next audience response question. And what I want to get you to think about is what's different from messenger RNA delivery of a protein for uh, an immune response versus the old-fashioned way of delivering a protein for an immune response. So which of the following is not an advantage of a messenger RNA vaccine as compared to a whole kill virus vaccine like the old influenza vaccines? So all of these are advantages of mRNA uh, vaccine delivery except one, and which is it? Is it robust activation of both CD4 and CD8 positive T cells? A possible rapid modification of the vaccine uh, with uh, new target proteins to produce new vaccines? No biohazards during manufacture? Protective immunity persists for more than a year? Um, elicits, elicits both Th1 and Th2 immune responses? Or um, could you repeat the question? Once again, Opman audience, you are very well informed. 62% of you got the right answer. Um, immunity of an mRNA vaccine, while originally people thought it might be longer lasting than immunity for more old-fashioned vaccines, it does not persist uh, for more than a year. And in fact, in most cases, uh, it probably only persists for a few months. And if anyone out there is like me and you actually got COVID uh, a few months after your Omicron booster, then uh, you know that that is true. So this is just a cartoon emphasizing the fact that um, while the persistence of immunity is not better, pretty much everything else is in terms of how proteins are presented to the immune system. Um, this looks to the immune system when you give an mRNA vaccine, protein expression looks exactly as if the cell were infected by an intact virus, but it's not. So how safe are mRNA vaccines? Um, we tend to think of these vaccines as being exceedingly safe, and they are. But I want to point out that we've learned a lot more about mRNA vaccine safety in the last few years, uh, in, in, sorry, in the last few months. Uh, and um, I want to talk about one of those uh, new vaccine-associated adverse events that I think is quite interesting and that is um, reports of delayed onset and chronic urticaria, and in this case, symptomatic dermographism, which means you draw something on the skin and a little red um, line comes up wherever you've drawn, following COVID-19 booster vaccinations. So there have now been several hundred reports in the literature of chronic urticaria after COVID vaccination. It's much more common with the Moderna vaccine than with the Pfizer vaccine for reasons that are unclear. Um, fortunately, these cases appear to all be responsive to traditional antihistamine therapy, and giving the patient daily antihistamines can uh, abate or prevent the symptoms. Usually, these cases resolve within a few days, but there have been reports of urticaria persisting for up to eight weeks after COVID vaccination in people who've never had urticaria before. So um, I know this to be true because one of these cases was my daughter 
who'd never had urticaria before, and called me three days after her Moderna vaccination and said, Papa, what is this? She had raised itchy bumps all over her body that persisted for about a week. So why is this happening? Is this an immune response to the RNA? Is it an immune response to the lipid? Is it, immu is it an immune response to the COVID spike protein? Or is it, is it something else we don't understand? And the bottom line is right now, we don't know. It is interesting, however, that COVID vaccines contain polyethylene glycol and similar cases of chronic urticaria have been associated with large molecular weight polyethylene glycols used as, as an excipient in other drugs. So stay tuned. Okay, um, could messenger RNAs be used for drug delivery? Is this the next platform for cabotegravir or rilpivirine or what have you? And the short answer is yes, but. So this is only a way to deliver protein or peptide-based drugs. Um, interestingly, you could, in theory, use messenger RNA to deliver antibodies, like Trip Gulick and Joe Aaron and Raj Gandhi's broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, although it would require two different RNAs, one for light chain and one for heavy chain. But in theory, there's no reason why you couldn't assemble antibody inside muscle cells, just like we're assembling spike protein. I think the problem, however, is that the duration of production is likely to be short. And although we haven't proven this in humans yet, I think the duration of expression of messenger RNA in cells is likely to be on the order of a few days, only two or three days. And so this would not be a platform for long-acting drug delivery unless the product was a long-acting protein like an antibody. Um, in addition, it's probably going to be difficult to regulate the amount of protein produced in different individuals. So when we give 1,000 people a COVID vaccine, we have no idea what the range of amount of, of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein expression is in those 1,000 individuals. And there may be a broad range of how much protein um, uh, you would make after getting, uh, uh, deliver, after getting uh, messenger RNA in your muscle. Okay, um, other possible ways to deliver messenger RNA. I, I, I wanna finish with what I think is a fascinating way uh, to possibly change the way we deliver vaccines and drugs, um, and that is transdermal delivery. So uh, I'm gonna talk about formulation and application of microarray patches or microneedle patches. So the, uh, the concept is to create a mold uh, with um, cone-shaped uh, microneedles, load nanoformulated drugs at high concentration in an aqueous gel that's then cast into that mold. You dry the mold, you put an occlusive backing on that mold, you apply, you pull that out of the mold and apply it as a patch to the skin. You detach the base plate. The drug is, or the vaccine, is actually in the needles, these micro needles. Um, it's deposited directly into the uh, uh, subdermal tissue. It forms a depot there, and in the case of drugs, the drug is gradually released over a period of days to weeks. Um, this technology was first developed for vaccines, not for drugs, to be used in situations where you either don't have access to sterile needles or for individuals who have needle phobia, um, or to make vaccine delivery more palatable for infants and small children. And there are clinical studies ongoing right now of using microarray patches to deliver vaccines. There, uh, this is just a, a, a electron micrographs to, to show you what these microneedles look like. They kind of look like microscopic Christmas trees. Um, they're very uh, 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 versatile in terms of how they can be structured and what you can put in a microneedle. You can put multiple drugs into one microneedle. You could maybe combine a drug and a vaccine, say for malaria. Uh, you could do all kinds of things with this technology, which is, it's, when I first heard about this, I thought it was complete science fiction, 
it, ladies and gentlemen, it's now in the clinic. So here is an example of delivering cabotegravir with a transdermal microarray patch. This is actually studies from rats, but there are clinical studies being planned with this technology right now. Um, the uh, the uh, top line, the, the blue line, is, um, uh, is conventional intramuscular cabotegravir LA. Um, the, uh, two, the red and the orange line are cabotegravir delivered by microarray patches, in one case as a nanoparticle, in one case as direct drug. The nanoparticle delivery of cabotegravir with a microarray patch produces concentrations almost as high as cabotegravir and lasting for almost as long. I will point out, however, that the cabotegravir dose with the microarray patch in this experiment is five times as high as the conventional cabotegravir injection. And so I think we still have a ways to go um, with uh, 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 making this technology uh, as uh, efficient for drug delivery as a more conventional direct uh, uh, needle injection, but it's, it's on its way. Um, there have also been modeling studies, including studies that we have published, suggesting that if you wanted to deliver enough cabotegravir to a human with a technology like this, so that you only had to get a patch once a, apply a patch once a month, the patch would have to be about the size of a queen-sized mattress duvet cover. <laughs> so for adults right now, it's not very feasible unless, you know, maybe it would, it would be a new spa treatment. You know, you get your mud application and then you get your cabotegravir duvet. Uh, but I think it does have significant promise for infants and neonates. You can put a small patch on the back of a neonate and they can't reach it and they can't pull it off. So what a great way to deliver drugs to neonates. So in summary, uh, mRNA packaged in lipid nanoparticles is the basis for both Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines. The success of these vaccine programs is likely to promote development of mRNA vaccines for other infections, including influenza. I predict in 30 years, all viral vaccines will be mRNA vaccines. It just makes sense. mRNA could be used for drug delivery with some limitations, and a variety of drug delivery platforms are in development for nanoparticles, including those used to package RNA. So don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Thank you. Well, that's great. And uh, I think I'll just start off with a question, uh, Charlie, picking up on where you left off. And um, going back, the, the COVID vaccine in particular, you laid it out pretty nicely. What are the side effects? And uh, is it the formulation just with nanoparticle itself? I mean, I've always defaulted to it's the antigen, it's the spike protein. Because a lot of what we see in the vaccine is similar to what we might see with a COVID infection. And the way I've presented it to patients um, when trying to talk about a vaccine, it's not a question of vaccine yes, no. It's a question of risk of vaccine complications versus risk of COVID complications. And, and then when you put it in that context, the, the actual infection is much worse in terms of its even long-term consequences. So, how, how are we going to sort this out? So, uh, Mike, I think um, it, it depends upon what side effect you're thinking about. Uh, you know, as a pharmacologist, um, there is a whole field called uh, 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 toxicology, which we don't often talk about at these meetings. But there's a science to understanding the mechanism of different adverse drug or vaccine effects. Um, and uh, it's hard to think about them in one big bucket. I think every side effect has a different mechanism, and I think that's certain to be true for vaccines. Um, I do think that the, con the common conventional side effects, the fever, the myalgias, the you know, fatigue um, after COVID vaccination, I think that's almost certainly the immune response to the 
spike protein. Some of these other weird side effects, like the chronic urticaria, I mean, we don't see chronic urticaria after COVID infection. And we don't see chronic urticaria after the Sinovac, which is a whole killed virus vaccine. So that's a side effect that is specific to mRNA delivery. And it's almost certainly not the spike protein, because we don't see that when the spike protein is delivered in other ways. Which aspect is it? Uh, we just don't know. Nobody's yeah. looked at it. Nobody's really studied it yet. Yeah, Raj. I think you just start talking about it. I think they turn it on yeah. automatically. Yeah. I mean, the other argument that there may be some um, deliveries related side effects come from the whole experience with the adenoviral vectors, this, this very rare complication of this thrombosis in the cerebral veins. Mm. That seems to be linked to the the Chadox um, delivery mechanism in Europe, you know, the one developed by Oxford and the one developed by um, J&J here. So I, I think there are some delivery mechanism specific side effects. Um, actually, don't, is it true that you don't get chronic urticaria after natural COVID? I don't think so. I mean, there are gazillions of people yeah. have gotten COVID yeah, so, and gazillions yeah, of people so have urticaria. Yeah, yeah. So but to see those two things intersect yeah. would not be a surprise. Yeah. So, Dr. Flexner, I had a question regarding your, your last statement that you expect uh, all uh, viral vaccines to be RNA-based vaccines in the, in the next few decades. And so with the transient nature of immunity related to uh, you know, the COVID vaccines in particular, are you, is that, do you think that's related to the nature of the COVID virus itself? or? Are there other strategies that are going to allow us to have more durable? Because certainly I wouldn't want to replace some of our decade-long uh, antiviral vaccines with, with uh, you know, something that's transient last month. So just your thoughts on that. Fascinating question. And it is absolutely correct that there are some vaccines that provide immunity for life after a single exposure. Mumps vaccine. All of us got mumps vaccine, or we got mumps as a child, and we'll never have mumps again. So why does the immune system work that way for mumps, but not for COVID vaccines? And I think there are a number of ways to look at that. One is, you know, mumps vaccine, it's a live uh, crippled virus doing essentially the same thing in its course of replication that the pathogenic virus does. Um, so it's exposure not just to a single antigen, but to lots of antigens, dozens of antigens. And maybe that increases the likelihood that if you ever see the virus again in your lifetime, you'll have at least one immunologic pathway that will shut down replication of the virus and protect you from getting infected again. That's one possibility. Um, another possibility is that there may be, and, and this is something there is some evidence for, Certain proteins are more likely to produce extended duration immunity than others. And maybe spike protein is not the best protein for producing long, uh, long duration immunity. Maybe we should be looking at internal antigens. And it's certainly true, for example, in, for influenza, for other RNA viruses. The nucleocapsid protein and some of the other internal proteins of influenza are more likely to produce a, a CD8 T cell response and are more likely to produce a long-lived immune response than surface proteins like hemagglutinin, which is what we usually think about. But response to those internal antigens does not prevent infection. It only prevents disease. And so, you, you know, you probably need a combination, if you wanted, to completely protect against flu and have long duration of immunity you'd probably have to have a combination of surface proteins or entry proteins, cell entry proteins, and internal antigens. But it, it's, a, it's a very complicated question to answer. And it, and it may also be where you're trying to get your immunity, right? So in the case of SARS-CoV-2, we're trying to get it in our mucosa, in our nasal mucosa. And so what we can elicit there may be less um, long-lasting and, and may not um, uh, elicit it to the same degree that our, than our um, hepatitis B vaccine, where you're trying to elicit it in, in a different site. And so I think that's part of the problem. It'll be really interesting to see what happens with the RSV vaccines. I think the RSV vaccines will get approved this year. Um, those are not actually mRNA vaccines. The lead ones are not mRNA vaccines. 
So we will see you know, where the RSV vaccines turn out in terms of their durability. I, th I think they're important advances for sure, um, but it'll be yeah. interesting to see, to see their durability and, and whether they too has a, have that same issue around mucosal immunity. In a season or two, they seem very, very effective though. Um, and then this whole issue that when you have a billion, uh, many billion people <laughs> get infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, then you have all these viral variants that, that, you know, that's pretty unprecedented too, even in hepatitis B. I mean, other viruses have a lot of viral variants, but this is unprecedented in terms of how many people got it at the same time. So. So while we're on the topic of just vaccinations in a way, the, the, one of the questions that came in from um, the Zoom audience was uh, with all the anti-vax discussion, I mean, there are reports of sudden death, especially among young people who have gotten an mRNA vaccine. And the hard part is that sudden death happens among young people at ran seemingly at random uh, and that's not new. So how do we get, how do we separate signal from noise? How do we know, how we're gonna be able to sort this out? Because the, all it takes is an N of one and it gets on Twitter and it gets magnified. It's not a, a question of did it happen or not. I don't think it's fake news in that way, but the coincidence of uh, this and, and both of you have been involved in drug development and, and new things come out and you have the FDA reporting system that's available to everyone, but those are just raw data that's put out there without any kind of adjudication or context. So maybe just a few minutes, because I think we all have these questions from patients as we recommend vaccines. How are we supposed to deal with that? Uh, again, no simple answer, Mike, um, and all of us probably have a different approach to this. I would say in terms of health policy, there's two things. One is I think we do need good post-marketing surveillance for products like this that are brought to the market very rapidly. And, and you know, think about it. The, the time it took to go from the laboratory to COVID vaccines in millions of arms is staggering in terms of the history of drug development. We have never brought a product to market that quickly and given it to so many people in such a short period of time. So the idea that because it's new technology, it's not gonna do bad things after we roll it out to million, millions of people, it's just naive. But what we do need to do, once we, once we discover weird and interesting toxicities like chronic urticaria, I think we need to be very honest about it. You know, this is something that can happen to you. This is something that might happen to you. And if you're a 25-year-old person who's otherwise healthy, and you don't have a risk of getting um, you know, severe COVID and being hospitalized, maybe you would rather not take that Moderna boost booster than taking a you know, one out of a thousand chance of having chronic urticaria. I mean, I, I think those are reasonable conversations to have with people. On the other hand, we have to keep reminding people how quickly we forget the death rate and the hospitalization rate from the original alpha and, and delta variants. I mean, it was horrible. Yeah. And, and you know, because it was three years ago, it's the, it's the I think we all have, uh, we have uh, societal Alzheimer's now. Nobody remembers that, uh, that, that this virus was as bad as it actually was. I mean, that distinguishing of signal of noise is really important in all drugs and all vaccines. I mean, I think in my mind, the VARES system that the CDC had actually worked. I mean, this, the VARES system showed us that the, the J&J vaccine had a effect on this thrombosis. It picked it up out of all the, the noise because it is true that, you know, there's, there are these rare events, but they were able to show that. And that gave me confidence that if there was other, you know, rare events that we would be able to kind of uh, distinguish the signal from the noise. So I, I think that's an example of where our surveillance does work. It'd be nice to actually do that across countries, you know, because then you get even greater numbers. But I think m most of these systems are done on a national or regional level. But, um, but I, I think that's how you do it. I remember when, the, we all remember when the COVID vaccines came out, people were worried because there's X number of heart attacks per year. And you can do the math that they're gonna be X number of heart attacks within, you know, 24 hours of a COVID vaccine. So that's where bears and those kind of things help us figure out, you know, um, a signal of noise. Right. And another question that came in from uh, the, the Zoom virtual audience was, uh, what do you think the future is for, for example, the J&J &J vaccine? It had that unique um, 
thrombotic event that was actually incredibly well worked up and very fast and solution, if you remember, it caused this uh, venous uh, thrombo, thrombo, thrombosis and um, I think there were maybe 13 or 14 cases initially and then they figured it out. But it's, it's an issue of maybe the tolerability or toxicity, but it's also how we're going to keep up with the changing antigen. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit in our cases. I'm not going to belabor it, but um, Charlie, I kind of agree with you that I think the mRNA technology, unless there's something that pops up that says this is totally unsafe, which it's hard to believe we'll see that after so many people have received it, but the ability to change quickly, um, it feels like we're going to have combo vaccines with the mRNA of, of whatever new variant of, of SARS-CoV-2 is, plus influenza uh, given maybe together uh, starting every fall. Yeah, to, to me, this is the big advantage of mRNA technology. It's so easy to modify it, and very quickly. I mean, all you have to do is push a few buttons in a, in a computer program, and you go from making, you know, spike protein to making influenza hemagglutinin. It's not quite that simple, but it, it's, it's close to. And, and the ability to modify the protein being expressed within the same family, it's, it's pretty simple. And, and so, um, uh, you know, this is what allowed us to develop an Omicron booster so rapidly. The, the weird thing about the Omicron booster, and we need to not lose sight of this, if you give the Omicron booster as a bivalent shot, it is not nearly as effective as if you were to give that Omicron booster by itself. And this is, you know, we need to make sure that doesn't give boosters a bad name. It's not because the mRNA of Omicron delivered as a, as a, you know, delivered in the same way is less immunogenic. It's because you're delivering it in combination with that delta antigen that your immune system already knows. So there's this funny uh, process in immunology called imprinting. So if I, if you recover from a specific influenza A strain, and I come back a year later and simultaneously uh, give you a vaccination that contains the hemagglutinin from that influenza strain and another influenza strain, your immune system will rev up to make a more robust response to the virus it's already seen. So you can think evolutionarily about why our immune system works that way. But the decision to do a bivalent booster resulted in a less effective Omicron vaccine. Now, thinking about it from a public health point of view, maybe that was the right thing to do. Because Omicron isn't wiping out humanity, but a more virulent and more contagious version of Delta might. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's better to be boosting people against Delta and giving them a, enough immunity against Omicron certainly to prevent serious disease and hospitalization, but not enough to prevent people from getting infected. So, so th these are the kinds of issues we're going to have to think about when we start putting these mRNAs together and, and decide, you know, what's the, what's, what's the best thing for an individual and what's the best thing for society. Raj, let me change gears a little bit to your talk at, about the monkeypox mortality. I think th at Croy, that was kind of a shocking uh, report because a lot of us had seen a number of people with monkeypox and some really sick folks. Uh, we personally, on our side, didn't see deaths per se. And you nicely showed the correlation with lower CD4 count. My question is, were those also patients who had high viremia of yeah. HIV which I would guess would be the case, right? Yeah. And, and your guess is largely right. I didn't uh, put this detail on the slide, but when they looked at people whose CD4 count was less than 100, okay, and they looked at people whose viral load was over 10,000, those yeah. people had a 30% mortality. And if they looked at people whose CD4 count was less than 100, whose viral load was undetectable, it was a 7% mortality. Yeah. So that's not saying, I mean, 7% is unacceptable, but there is a correlation also with viral load for sure. This is not the only data, that, these are not the only data, though, that showed that advanced HIV has worse monkeypox outbreaks. If you remember this, uh, CDC, uh, worse, worse monkeypox, uh, MPOX, sorry, um, yeah. uh, outcomes. 
The CDC had a case series from just a few months ago that looked at, in the United States, hospitalized people um, with HIV, and, and they too showed a, um, a very um, bad outcome in a number of people with advanced HIV. So I think what I'm trying to say is if you have someone with MPOX, absolutely test them for, for HIV. I think we do this, but just to make sure that it's being done, test them for HIV because they might have unrecognized HIV. And if you find they have HIV, of course, you want to know their CD4 count, and you're going to want to treat their HIV quickly. That's, that's what I'm taking yeah, I think away. that's a key point. And, and to me, it re, what your answer just now re or underscores again is the notion that it's not so much CD4 count that's a direct reflection of uh, immunologic integrity, if you will, of somebody. It's really the virus. HIV is an immunosuppressive uh, sort of agent. And when the viral load is high, the immune system doesn't function as well. When you drop it down with antiretroviral therapy, the immune system function improves dramatically. And that's what causes the iris phenomena. And I think the points you made in terms of starting the antiretroviral therapy relatively late, and if I heard right, even after the MPOX lesions were resolving to some degree, and you give it, then you give the antiretroviral therapy, and it's like there's this reawakening of the immune system and the, the lesions uh, either get worse or reappear. Is that right? Yeah, some of those cases, and the, there's a publication that accompanies that presentation that's in The Lancet, but the pictures are really striking as to how much MPOX um, burden there is. A lot of viral replication that continues. And maybe I'll just say here, I didn't cover this because of time, but ticoviramab was used in some of these uh, individuals with advanced HIV. And I would agree, if you have a person with advanced HIV, you absolutely should use ticoviramab. Um, they did look at five people um, where they had persistent virus replication, progressive MPOX, and of the five people that they characterized who got ticoviramab, three of them did develop resistance. And so I want to uh, make the following point that with really, really immunocompromised people, first we need to know does ticoviramab work. We, we still don't know if ticoviramab works. We give it under kind of a um, ex expanded access but to advanced patients, but the STOMP study, which is going on even as we speak, is trying to get an answer once and for all, does the drug actually change progression of MPOX? Um, and so we need to know the answer. I think there's 60, maybe uh, 65, 70 people enrolled. Numbers have come way down in terms of US numbers, international numbers, but still getting an answer is critical. If we find that ticoviramab works, um, then in advanced infections, immunosuppressed patients, I think we're going to need to be able to add on another drug uh, to, to avoid these kind of outcomes. Right. So, so Raj, the, I, I found that data about the iris patients particularly disturbing. If you had a patient presenting with MPOX and they did not know they were HIV positive and you tested them and they are HIV positive, how would you manage them? So today what I do is, so you have someone with MPOX, they have a number of skin lesions, you test them for HIV, you find them to be positive for HIV and they don't know they, they have it. Today what I would do is I would um, start antiretrovirals at that point, um, understanding that um, we don't know the optimal time to start, but my worry is if I, particularly if their CD4 count is low, if, and I, I would do it even if their CD4 count is high, but if their CD4 count is low, I would worry that if I waited until they got to that level of MPOX, that by then the ship has sailed, then, then things are really, you're in a bad place. Now, I don't know how we're gonna get an answer uh, to the study, we'd have to have the numbers to do you know, another, um, lost the number for the ACDG study of 5165 or whatever the study was that looked at early versus deferred. I don't think we're gonna do that in MPOX. I think we're gonna have to do um, early treatment and look at observational study. But I, I wouldn't wait for ART because I would worry about that progression. And what would you do if that, such a person developed iris? I think then you would do what we do now with iris. I mean, we would manage it. I can't, I think some of those instances they gave steroids as to, their numbers were too low to, to know if there's an effect, but. So, yeah. you know, I, I actually started my scientific career making recombinant vaccinia virus, live yeah. pox virus yeah. vaccines, and this is what live pox virus does in people with compromised T cell immunity. It disseminates and kills you. Um, should we develop MPOX immune globulin like we have for vaccinia? So, you know, we did, I didn't, um, I don't know this literature very extensively, but there are other adjunctive measures that you can use for MPOX beyond ticoviramab. Um, obviously, ticoviramab is not proven for MPOX, but it um, has a rationale. Um, there are uh, other antivirals. I think brinsidopavir has sometimes been used. 
I think there actually are immunoglobulin-based products. I think it may even be someone in the audience will know anti-vaccinia immunoglobulin, that, that in these Hail Mary kind of situations, mm -hmm. people have, have pulled out. Yeah, I mean, so, it, um, it yeah. probably would have some activity. There's yeah. a lot of similarities between those two viruses. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. This is the reason, though, that we don't give the ACAM um, smallpox vaccine. That is a live attenuated virus vaccine, and we don't give it in part, um, we use the, the Genios vaccine, the MVA vaccine in part, because it's not, even though it's a viral vector, it's not kind of a replicating viral vector to the same right. extent as ACAM is. And people are worried that if you give someone with undiagnosed HIV ACAM that you could have a, a problem yeah. in terms of just what you were saying, yeah. the virus replicating. Great discussion, thank you. Um, it's time for a break, so again, Channeling Hamilton will take a break, go away with me for 15 minutes, we'll go upstate and then we'll come back. Uh, so we'll be back about the top of the hour. I just, yeah, I love the energy of what's happening, at least here in the room, hopefully it's playing over on Zoom, but it's just nice to have everyone back together again. Uh, I will say that in, in follow up on Charlie Flexner's talk, um, and, and for the women, I think it's worth a trip into the men's room just to scope this out. But in the urinals, there's these little pads. These, they're about yay big or plastic, and they have micro needles on them. So I thought, just be careful you don't put them on your back as you go out. Who knows what you're going to inject? Um, so I'm real pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Christina Musney, who is a colleague of mine at UAB, has worked on STIs for uh, quite a while, and especially in prevention and treatment. She uh, sees patients at the 1917 clinic in Birmingham and really is our go-to person for all kinds of questions about STIs. Uh, I just called her recently about a confounding case and she was Johnny on the spot in that regard, and Christina on the spot, I guess, in that case. And so it's great to have her here. She's going to give us an update on STIs, what's old and new. She's got 25 minutes. She probably needs 50, but I know she'll do a good job coming through. So welcome, Christina. All right. Good morning, everyone. Super excited to be here. This is actually my first Opman conference. So, all right. I have a lot of information to cover in a very short period of time. So I am going to go through a lot of this fairly quickly. And hopefully we'll have time for questions on the panel and then later during the round tables. So these are my disclosures. The most important one that I need to tell you about is that I was a consultant to the CDC for the 2021 STI treatment guidelines, and I am a co-author on those guidelines, many of which we'll be talking about a couple of changes for the treatment of some of our common STIs in today's presentation. So our learning objectives today, I don't have time to go over every single STI, um, so I have picked some select ones. I am going to mention a couple of comments about bacterial vaginosis, um, who the majority of epidemiological data suggest is sexually transmitted. Um, then I'm going to talk about chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomonas, mycoplasma genitalium treatment updates, um, as well as a couple of comments about syphilis, a few comments about pelvic inflammatory disease and vulvovaginal candidiasis. And then at the end, I'm going to focus on a couple of these doxy PEP studies um, that Dr. Gandhi referred to during his presentation. All right, so here we go. So for BV, um, BV is our most common vaginal infection, 30% lifetime prevalence across U.S. women and globally. Um, as I mentioned, major majority of data suggests that it is a sexually transmitted infection. The current controversy remains that we don't know the exact etiological agent which causes BV. Um, for the guidelines update, there were several changes to the guidelines, um, adding single dose therapies available for women. So in prior guidelines, all of the available recommended and alternative treatments were multi-dose therapies. We now have added several single dose. Um, the first one is a long-acting clindamycin phosphate intravaginal cream single dose. 
Uh, this one was actually FDA approved in 2004, but was not manufactured in the United States until, until recently. However, it now is available here, so we did add it to the guidelines. Um, we also have a higher dose metronidazole vaginal gel at 1.3%, which was FDA approved in 2014. And then the oral 5-nitromidazole medication secnidazole, uh, which is a next generation 5-nitromidazole that's come after metronidazole and tinidazole. That's a two gram oral granule dose that got FDA approved for BV in 2017. The quirk about this single dose medicine is that it comes in a granular form. So you do have to dissolve those granules in yogurt, pudding, or applesauce. Um, and the patient has to eat that serving of whatever they dissolved it in and then drink a glass of water afterwards. So there is a little bit of patient counseling about taking this medication. There were no data available suggesting superior efficacy of these three single-dose BV medicines compared to other meds currently recommended. Um, so basically, oral signatazole got added to the alternative list, and which I have on the next slide, and there's also no data in pregnant women. So basically, the old is our current recommended regimens are the same for BV, which is either oral multidose metronidazole, five days of Metrogel, or clindamycin cream for seven days. This is the shorter acting formulation. The alternative regimens did stay the same, except we added oral signidazole, um, single dose. You may wonder why do we not put oral signidazole in the recommended category? For several reasons, we did not do this. First of all, the cost is fairly significantly higher. Um, than oral metronidazole. Also, we don't have as much data on long-term outcomes in patients that have used it. Um, in addition, um, oral signidazole, many patients may not be able to get it as part of their insurance plan. They may have to get a PA to get it. So moving on for chlamydia, um, there was a major treatment management change in the guidelines for chlamydia. Um, before azithromycin, one gram oral single dose was the recommended regimen. This now has switched to doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice daily for seven days. Um, this was a big change for the chlamydia section of the guidelines. They made this change in the recommended dose for several reasons. Um, one of them is clinical trials which have found that azithromycin is not as efficacious for rectal chlamydial infection. Um, they found efficacy rates 20 to 30 percent lower for azithromycin compared to doxycycline in rectal chlamydia treatment trials. Also, it is not um, as efficacious azithromycin in symptomatic genital chlamydia in men and possibly oral pharyngeal chlamydia. So several types of chlamydial infections at different anatomical locations um, multiple clinical trials have shown that doxycycline is actually more efficacious than oral azithromycin, which led to this change. It is important to note that doxycycline is not recommended for use in pregnancy. So women who are pregnant that have chlamydial infection, the recommended dose still is oral azithromycin. Um, but you definitely want to get a test of cure uh, for pregnant women if they take azithromycin. So follow up after a positive chlamydial test, um, HIV negative men who have sex with men with a rectal chlamydia diagnosis should be offered HIV PrEP if they are not already taking it. It's also recommended to rescreen women and men three months after treatment. Repeat infections due to having resuming sexual activity with an untreated sexual partner is the most common cause of a repeat infection um, in this situation. So you want to make sure that all the sexual partners within the past 60 days um, get treated as contacts to chlamydia and also are tested at the same time. And it's not recommended to repeat chlamydial testing less than four weeks after the initial positive chlamydia test if you're using a NAP um, because you could still have dead DNA from the chlamydial organisms that may cause a false positive test. So now we're moving on to gonorrhea. So you all, I'm sure, have seen this in your patients with the purulent penile discharge and then the gram-negative intracellular diplococci um, on urethral gram stain. 
So I'm sure most of you have heard, we continue to have issues with drug resistance in gonorrhea um, in the United States and across the world. Um, the CDC has this gonococcal isolate surveillance project here in the United States. This has been going on since 1986, so quite some time they've been monitoring this. Um, over time, they have seen significant increase in resistance in fluoroquinolone, such as ciprofloxacin. They took ciprofloxacin off the recommended treatments in 2007 now, so it's been quite some time since that has gone. Um, tetracyclines have had very high levels of resistance, so doxycycline is not typically used um, to treat gonorrhea. Um, with regards to um, penicillin, that has also had um, fairly steady, pretty high resistance rates. Um, more recently, since 2015, 2014, resistance to azithromycin has been going up in this country. Um, before we had azithromycin two gram, higher single dose as an alternative therapy for gonorrhea. So that alone has gone away. I'll show you in the next coming slides. There's also been fairly steady, very low levels of cefixime and uh, ceftriaxone resistance. So not as significant as the other antimicrobial classes. However, there has recently been, as of six weeks ago in Massachusetts, two cases of cefixime resistant gonorrhea um, that have been seen in this country. There is more resistance in cefixime around the world. Um, and there's also these MIC creeps for both uh, ceftriaxone and cefixime that is very concerning as we're running out of drugs uh, to treat gonorrhea. So basically in the updated guidelines, Previously, we were treating gonorrhea with 250 milligram IM ceftriaxone plus the single dose azithromycin. That has now gone away. Um, now it is recommended just to give a dose of ceftriaxone. However, the dose is higher now, up at 500 milligrams due to this MIC creep that I was talking about. Um, it's important to note if your patient weighs more than 150 kilograms, you would want to go up on the dose of the shot to one gram of ceftriaxone. For the alternative regimens, uh, there's gentamicin IM in a single dose plus oral azithromycin two gram single dose. So we cannot give oral azithromycin two grams alone because of emerging resistance. So that's why it's uh, put in combination therapy with gentamicin. For the, the other alternative treatment could be oral cefixime. In the past, it was at a 400 milligram dose. Now they've gone up to 800 milligrams for oral cefixime due to the MIC creep. So follow up after a positive gonorrheal test. If the patient has oral pharyngeal gonorrhea, it is recommended to perform a test of cure. Um, there is some data to suggest that antimicrobial resistance may be more prevalent in oral pharyngeal gonorrhea. Why is that compared to other urogenital sites? It is postulated that there could be some transfer of resistance between uh, Neisseria gonorrhea and other Neisseria species that are living in the oral pharynx ex commensal organisms. So it is important to perform a test of cure. If you are gonna do that with a, a NAT test, a nucleic acid amplification test, you really want to repeat that test closer to the 14 day mark because you don't want to pick up dead DNA, as I mentioned, for chlamydia. Um, if that test of cure is positive, you definitely would want to get a gonorrhea culture to do antimicrobial susceptibility testing, especially if your patient does not report interval sexual activity. Similar to chlamydia, you want to rescreen women and men um, three months after treatment. Again, repeat infections are most likely due to reinfection. However, if they do have a repeat infection and there's a concern for treatment failure, you definitely want to get a gonorrhea culture and do antimicrobial resistance testing on it. Um, you probably are going to want to contact a specialist in this area or potentially call CDC. Um, and options in this setting, it's been discussed, you could either give the patient a gram of IM ceftriaxone, even if they weigh less than 150 milligrams. This is in settings of potential treatment failure. And there is a little bit of emerging data about giving ertapenem 
for three days for these patients. But you definitely would want to get in touch um, with specialists in this area. Similarly to chlamydia, everybody with all the partners within the past 60 days, you would want them to get treated. So moving on to vaginal infection, Trichomonas, um, our most common um, non-viral STI worldwide. Um, these are two pictures. The picture on the left is um, the most common vaginal discharge seen with trichomonas, which is typically this yellow, frothy, bubbly looking discharge. And on the right is a picture of a um, cervix and a lady that has trichomonas. Uh, it can cause punctate mucosal hemorrhages in the cervical mucosal tissue. Um, we don't see this very common for trichomonas, but it is pretty pathognomonic when we do see it. So I know I'm going over a lot of management updates, but I do want to mention a couple little quirks about testing recommendations for trichomonas. Um, right now in the United States, the only population for where routine screening is recommended is HIV positive women. That's currently at entry to care and annually thereafter. Only certain other populations that are at high risk, it's recommended to consider screening, but there's no firm recommendations on screening everyone right now for trichomonas. So the other high prevalence populations would be STI clinics, correctional facilities, asymptomatic people who are at high risk for having multiple risk factors. Um, I will say that the, the national prevalence of trichomonas based on recent NHANES data was 1.8% in women and 0.5% in men. At our STD clinic in Birmingham, where I work at, we have about 16,000 patients that come every year. We actually implemented routine trichomonas screening in 2012 by NAT tests. And I did a study almost a decade ago now um, looking at the prevalence of trichomonas in men and women at this clinic using that NAT test, it was 27% total, 20% in women, and 9.8% in men. So we're in a very high prevalence setting where definitely you want to continue screening. So that's an example of a high prevalence setting where you would consider screening. So with regards to diagnostics for trichomonas, there has been a lot of new diagnostic modalities coming down the pipeline mainly these nucleic acid amplification tests. Um, the, the mainstays has always been wet mount microscopy, which is not very sensitive at all, only 44 to 68% in the best of hands. Um, and then culture had traditionally been used as the gold standard, and it still is used in cases of suspected treatment resistance where we can do antimicrobial susceptibility testing similar to gonorrhea. However, it is not the new gold standard now, because we have all of these new trichomonas diagnostic tests. These have come down the pipeline over the past um, 10 to 11 years, um, and we have now about seven to eight of them that are currently FDA approved in the United States. I know it's a very busy slide. I'm not gonna read through the whole thing. I just wanna call to your attention that some of these tests are only FDA approved in women. Others are not, F uh, these, the tests that are only FDA approved in women have to be internally validated if they're going to be used for male patient care. Um, one of the tests, the roche cobos assay, includes mycoplasma genitalium, NAT testing, with the trichomonas test. So that's opened up some new interesting questions because people ordering this test for trichomonas are also getting mycoplasma genitalium results, and it's not currently recommended to screen people for mycoplasma genitalium in this country including pregnant women. And so we're getting a lot of questions surrounding the use of that test in particular. Um, the most newest test is the Visby test, which is in a handheld cartridge. Um, you can see that here on this slide. This is a point of care nucleic acid amplification test where you can get your result in real time in 25 minutes. So this is potentially can be used at the point of care to diagnose people with a highly sensitive and specific test. Um, that test includes gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas testing. So we also had a major uh, change in the treatment of trichomonas in the guidelines. Previously, only HIV-infected women was recommended to use multi-dose metronidazole, 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Um, that was based on a prior randomized controlled trial done in 2010, published by Patty Kissinger at Tulane University in HIV-infected women. 
which found superior efficacy of the multi-dose regimen compared to the single-dose 2-gram stat oral metronidazole. Since that time, we were able to do another randomized control trial in HIV uninfected women, um, which I'll have on the next slide, which showed, again, superior efficacy of the multi-dose metronidazole regimen. So now, in the new guidelines, multi-dose metronidazole is recommended for all women. However, a similar randomized controlled trial has not been done in either HIV-infected or HIV-uninfected men, so the treatment recommendation for men is still a 2-gram single oral dose of metronidazole. For women and men, tinidazole 2-gram oral dose is an alternative regimen. However, there is a higher cost of this medication. So for this STI in particular, this is the first time that national guidelines have a discordance in the recommended treatment of an STI based on gender, which is an interesting scenario. So the randomized controlled trial that um, helped change the recommendation to multi-dose metronidazole in, in all women was done um, at Jackson, Mississippi, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and UAB in Birmingham at our STD clinic. Um, and we found, so basically we randomized people to two gram oral dose of metronidazole versus seven days multi-dose metronidazole. And test of cure was at four weeks either by culture or NAT test. Women who got the multi-dose metronidazole had an 11% positive repeat infection rate compared to 19% in the single dose group, which was highly statistically significant uh, difference between groups. So that's why the recommendation changed. So since the guidelines were published, we have oral signidazole, which I mentioned to you all about that got FDA approved for BV and did get included in the guidelines. Um, we were able to do a clinical trial for trichomoniasis with oral signidazole. Um, we found a very high efficacy rate in that clinical trial, 10 sites across the United States. The efficacy rate was 92.2% of oral signidazole. Um, and there were four HIV-infected women with trichomonas in this trial, all at UAB, that all successfully cleared their infection after oral signidazole. So oral signidazole actually got added, um, recommended by the FDA for treatment of trichomoniasis in women and men um, in June of 2021. However, the guidelines had already been written and they were on their way to being published, so it's not currently included there. I think interesting future discussions will be where does this fit in in the guidelines. Um, also, I just want to point out that oral signidazole, two gram single dose, is the only oral medication we have to treat both BV and trichomonas in women that's a single dose, which could be important for some people that you may worry have adherence issues. Another thing with regards to oral metronidazole in the guidelines is that there's always been this warning about refraining from alcohol use while taking oral metronidazole. So actually, the CDC, when we were re reviewing all of the literature for the guidelines, asked us to really look into that, and our committee actually did. The paper that provided the majority of the data that we reviewed was actually in Norwegian, so I had to get it translated, which I have a picture of this paper here. Um, trying to get a paper translated is, is an interesting feat that took me quite some time, but when we finally got it translated, it shed new light on the situation that their, the authors, after their extensive review of all of the literature, did not believe that metronidazole and alcohol use increased people's risk of having this disulfiram-like reaction. And so when the CDC guidelines came out um, in 2021, Twitter became happy about being able to drink while you're taking metronidazole. So I'm not saying everybody should go out and drink large quantities of alcohol while they're taking metronidazole. But if you want to have one or two glasses of wine, I don't think it's going to be a big issue. Um, I'm not going to read through the slide. It's very busy, but it has all of the data from the, the Norwegian paper, which summarized a lot of the studies that have been done and a lot of the information, um, basically refuting the claim that this is a significant problem. 
So moving on to mycoplasma genitalium, um, this was our emerging STI a few years ago. Um, there's been a lot more uh, studies done with mycoplasma genitalium since the last version of the guidelines. However, screening, as I mentioned, is not routinely recommended across the board. Diagnostic testing in certain situations is recommended, and those are in people with persistent or recurrent urethritis or cervicitis. Um, we do have several FDA-approved nucleic acid amplification tests available for MG now, um, three in this country, and one of them includes, um, actually two of them includes testing also for trichomonas. Um, there's insufficient evidence of the natural history of mycoplasma genitalium in women and men to warrant routine screening, and there hasn't been any studies conducted that show routine screening decreases the risk of adverse outcomes. However, for cases of persistent urethritis, cervicitis, and potentially pelvic inflammatory disease where mycoplasma genitalium is tested for, there has been another change in the recommended treatments section of the guidelines. So there's been a lot of information um, looking at resistance rates in azithromycin, which was a mainstay of treatment of mycoplasma genitalium in the past. Resistance over the past seven to eight years has gone from 10% to 50% in azithromycin um, to the point where companies are developing uh, nucleic acid amplification tests for mycoplasma genitalium that also incorporate, incorporate macrolide resistance testing. There are some available outside of the U.S. now. However, there's not one currently available in the United States. Um, because of this situation, doxycycline has now become one of the preferred agents um, to start treating mycoplasma genitalium. The problem with doxycycline is that there is some baseline resistance in doxycycline, and doxycycline typically only reduces the organism load for the pathogen. It does not essentially cure it. So there were several clinical trials done in Australia looking at sequential therapy for mycoplasma genitalium, basically giving doxycycline first, and then following that with moxifloxacin. So basically, you're giving the doxycycline to decrease the organism load, and you're giving the moxifloxacin to cure the pathogen. So that's basically the recommended regimen now. If you don't have macrolide resistance testing available, which we currently don't in the U.S., if you do have that available, if, if we have that available in the future, and that test shows that your isolate is susceptible to a macrolide, um, there is a regimen where you could give azithromycin higher doses first, um, then followed, um, well, I'm sorry, if it's macrolide sensitive, you would still give the doxycycline followed by azithromycin instead of moxifloxacin. So for pelvic inflammatory disease, there was one change for pelvic inflammatory disease. In the past, it was only recommended to consider giving metronidazole as part of the PID treatment regimen. However, there was a randomized controlled trial that got published um, with showing that women who were randomized, who all the women in this trial had PID, they were either randomized to typical PID treatment with no metronidazole versus typical PID treatment with metronidazole. Um, and they looked at clinical improvement at three days. They also looked at the presence of anaerobic organisms in the endometrium, clinical cure, adherence, and tolerability at 30 days. The primary outcome of clinical improvement at three days was similar between groups. However, there were significantly better um, secondary outcomes in the oral metronidazole group. Um, women in that group had less prevalence of BV, um, they had less presence of those anaerobic organisms in the endometrium, and they were able to tolerate, tolerate it without major issues. So now we have incorporated recommending to give oral metronidazole in combination with typical PID treatment regimens. Um, remember, because azithromycin is now not the recommended treatment for chlamydial infection, uh, the PID treatment for outpatient, the first regimen is going to be ceftriaxone, 500 milligram, single dose, plus the doxycycline for 14 days, 
with oral metronidazole for 14 days. So that would be your most common regimen. I have other potential regimens listed on these slides. You can refer to in the slides. Um, for the IV PID treatment regimens for patients that have to be hospitalized um, for their PID, um, pretty much those stay the same except recommending to add metronidazole to that regimen as well. All right, moving on to syphilis. So everyone has probably seen a shanker, which I have two pictures here, one in a male and one in a female. And we've all seen the secondary syphilis rash. So for syphilis treatments, there were not any major updates in current recommended syphilis treatment regimens. Um, for early syphilis, which includes primary, secondary, and early latent, it's still recommended to give a 2.4 million units IM benzathine penicillin G shot. Um, for people with late syphilis, um, to include syphilis of unknown duration, late latent syphilis, um, or tertiary syphilis that's not neurosyphilis, you would give the 7.2 million unit dose, which is 2.4 weekly for three weeks. Um, still for neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, et cetera, you would still wanna give your IV uh, penicillin regimen uh, that has previously been recommended before in prior guidelines. So this is the old, which I still use this all the time. Um, this was a titer response algorithm published by one of my colleagues, Jeff Klausner, um, back in 2008 in a syphilis newsletter that came out through public health department clinics. I still give a copy of this to our fellows, nurse practitioners, my medical students, pretty much everybody that I work with. And I keep one for myself um, because I think it's a very helpful algorithm to guide you about following the RPR, the VDRL titers after you treat someone for syphilis. Um, and so basically, you want to make sure you know whether or not the patient is HIV infected or not, because that's gonna depend on how long you follow these people out and when you can declare that they're actually a treatment failure. So I will direct everybody to these slides. I'm not gonna read through this entire algorithm. If people have questions about this, we can talk about it um, at one of the sessions later today. There were, however, several other updates in syphilis management. Um, available data at the time suggests no clinical benefit to giving more than one 2.4 million unit dose for early syphilis in HIV infected patients. So that has not changed as of now. And then in patients with isolated ocular or otic signs and symptoms, reactive syphilis serological results and confirmed abnormalities on exam, an LP is not absolutely necessary in these cases. Um, if you're not concerned, you know, if they're not having headaches, neck stiffness, other neurological complaints, an LP is not necessarily needed, as a lot of these cases could just be isolated to the eye or to the ear, um, and you basically would treat them the same anyway. And so an LP is not necessarily recommended in those cases anymore. In addition, repeat LPs are now not necessary for HIV uninfected patients or HIV infected patients on highly active antiretroviral therapy after treatment of neurosyphilis who exhibit appropriate serological and clinical response. So that was a change in the guidelines. I have one slide about vulvovaginal candidiasis because I thought it was important enough to mention it here. Clearly this is not a sexually transmitted infection. However, oral fluconazole is used so frequently um, around the country, around the world for treatment of this. And a lot of people that have STIs who take antibiotics get a yeast infection while they're on the antibiotics or shortly thereafter. It is very important to know now that oral fluconazole is not recommended in any trimester of pregnancy um, due to multiple studies showing adverse birth outcomes um, in many of the infants in these studies. So if you have a pregnant woman who has a VBC, you would want to treat with an intravaginal preparation and not give them oral fluconazole. Just wanted to mention that. So finally, my last couple slides are about the DOXY-PEP studies um, that were mentioned earlier today. So just to remind everyone, DOXY-PEP, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, 
is giving a 200 milligram dose of oral doxycycline within 72 hours after condomless sex. Um, there has been three studies, Dr. Gandhi mentioned in one of his slides, um, of men who have sex with men and transgender women who have all shown that doxyprep was effective in reducing rates of chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea um, by up to 60% in users of that medication. Um, two of these were French studies, and one of them was conducted um, in San Francisco and Seattle. The latest French study, the third study, was just presented at CROI last month. Uh, this was the DoxyVax trial uh, from France. Um, this trial involved men who have sex with men taking HIV PrEP for greater than six months who had had a bacterial STI in the past 12 months but no current STI symptoms. They um, randomized two to one uh, 332 to the doxypep versus 170 to no pep. 80% um, of these participants were Caucasian and majority of them were born and living in France at the time. This study also had two arms. It was actually a four-arm study where men were also getting a meningococcal vaccine that's currently under study to prevent gonorrhea infections. So they were also looking at that in this study. Um, similar to the two prior studies in MSM and transgender women, this study also found a statistically significant decrease in incident bacterial STIs, particularly chlamydia and syphilis, in men who were on the doxypep. They also did not find any interaction between the use of doxypep and use of that meningococcal vaccine in this population. Um, with regards to decrease in incident gonorrheal infections, um, that was a little borderline for the doxypep. However, it was statistically significant for use of that vaccine that I was talking about. However, the biggest unfortunate finding that came out of CROI was that doxypep did not prevent STIs among cisgender women. So this was another oral presentation at CROI. Um, last month, this was the first study of doxypep in cisgender women. Um, it was a Kenyan trial, and they enrolled 449 women ages 18 to 30 taking HIV PrEP for that study. They were randomized to receive doxypep after sex or standard of care. Standard of care here was quarterly STI testing and treatment after diagnosis. Women in the study were followed for a year. 18% had an STI at enrollment, so they were a high-risk population of women. Majority of this was chlamydia. During the one-year follow-up period for participants on this trial, they had 109 new STIs diagnosed, which was a 27% incident, so high. Um, 50 in the doxypep versus 59 in the standard of care, and that difference was not statistically significant. The majority of the incident STIs here were chlamydial, 78%. Um, there is no significant difference in the number of new cases for chlamydia or gonorrhea among women in the intervention versus standard of care arm. And there was only one new case of syphilis in this study, so they could not really comment on the use of doxypep for syphilis um, prevention in this study. So there was a lot of discussion at CROI about why did this happen? Why was this trial not as effective as the other trials? Um, one, of the, one of the initial reasons were that there may be differences in anatomy between women and men, and that the, the vaginal tissues in women or the rectal tissues are not absorbing doxycycline as efficiently as they would in men. However, there was an additional pharmacokinetic study at CROI done, which showed similar distributions of these medications in the tissue. So I'm not sure that this is the, the right answer for why this trial uh, was not significant. Um, another concern could be rising antibiotic resistance um, in these women or potential lack of adherence. However, there were new, no new HIV cases among women on this study in either group, suggesting that they were highly um, adherent to their HIV PrEP. So leading investigators to think they were adherent to their doxy prep as well. So in summary, um, I've gone quickly over several updates and treatment recommendations for a multitude of STIs. Um, no major changes in syphilis 
oral fluconazole no longer recommended in pregnant women, and then we talked about doxypep. And here's a picture of our guideline group um, for the CDC. This was sadly our last meeting together before the pandemic. So I'm excited to see these people sometime soon, I hope. Thank you. Well done. Okay, we'll do the questions a little bit. I, I, as you were going over the alcohol metronidazole thing, I, it, it flashed, uh, I flashed to a line that I use a lot on rounds when we're talking about in the 80s, we never used beta blockers for heart failure. That was a no-no. Um, that there's a thin line difference between what's dogma and what's dog manure. So I think we found out that the alcohol and metronidazole may be dog manure uh, that, we've, that we've thrown around for years and it's no fun. So our uh, anchor leg here today um, is Rafi Landovitz on talking about all kinds of prevention, but especially PrEP. And uh, he's from UCLA and has led a lot of the studies that have guided us um, on how to use PrEP in practice. So, Rafi, it's great to have you here. And uh, if you have any questions about Broadway between uh, uh, Trip and Rafi, I think you can get it all covered. Thanks, Mike. And it's, it's always great to be uh, back at OpMan. So thanks for having me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have with Dr. Mosny a little bit later. Um, I, I think we'll delve a little bit more into this new concept to us all that um, the anatomy between men and women are actually different. That was, I thought that was important. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, for HIV and generally uh, uh, prevention. Uh, these are my disclosures. And I don't think I need to make a case to this audience that um, 40 years on the HIV pandemic, we really have still unacceptable rates of new HIV infections. So we're desperate for new prevention strategies. And that's sort of the context for why we keep sort of pushing forward with all these different prevention interventions. So we have a large fairly, uh, toolbox that's been studied of interventions that can be effective for HIV prevention. I'm gonna mostly focus on pre-exposure prophylaxis today, and then some final comments at the end about some other strategies as well. So I always like to just start, make sure we're all on the same page. I think everyone here is probably familiar with the concept of PrEP, but not too long ago, not uh, 10 years ago, this was a foreign concept, right? And how did we get here? A lot of people said, you're gonna give uh, anti-HIV medications to people without HIV chronically? That's crazy, don't do that. It's gonna be costly, it's gonna cause side effects, it might not work, it's gonna cause resistance in the HIV that will break through it. What are you doing? And I'll be honest, I was, whoa. I was one of the huge skeptics. I said, this isn't gonna work. Anyway, um, where we are now, and, and the people who were prescient enough to think that this was gonna work, they made analogy to this concept that we were somewhat familiar with from post-exposure prophylaxis, right? Someone who was exposed by either a needle stick or a splash of some sort, or a sexual exposure to HIV, um, could take a potent antiviral regimen as quickly as possible, but the guidelines say certainly within 72 hours of that exposure, and that would drop your risk of acquiring HIV in a post-exposure way. And the best numbers we have somewhere around 81%, but that was for single agent AZT used in an inconsistent regimen. So then someone said, well, how do we minimize that time from the exposure to the first dose of that preventive medicine that works if you believe the animal models that suggest that that door to needle time analog from our cardiac literature of door to exposure time is really critical for efficacy. And someone said, well, obviously, you minimize that exposure to dose, uh, dose to exposure time by actually having it on board when the exposure takes place, right? So it was on that concept, that concept of pre-exposure prophylaxis was born. And that's sort of how we got here. So there, we have a number of agents now that are FDA approved for pre-exposure prophylaxis. I'm gonna go through each one and talk about its relative advantages and disadvantages. So the first one to be approved back in 2012 was TDF-FTC, 
also known as FTDF, um, now available generically. So it does have a brand name that many are familiar with, Truvada, but we refer to it as FTDF. And the original studies um, were confusing. This is one of my favorite slides. I actually made this slide in 2015 um, because I know when people put up tables of data, I immediately start checking my Instagram feed. I don't know about you guys. Um, but you, you know, the, the concept here is the character shows the sex at birth of the population that was studied and how filled up in blue um, the, uh, the character is, is the point estimate in the various studies for HIV prevention. And this is something that in the Northeast of the United States happens very frequently um, around holiday time, you know, the churches and, and uh, synagogues and, and mosques that are doing fundraising, they have a thermometer outside of the place of worship and they do fundraising and they fill up the thermometer with sort of colored, a um, uh, 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 color to show how far they are in their fundraising. And so I thought that was a really good way to show these data. And uh, my, my, my boss, my division chief, Judy Courier, who many of you know, who's brilliant, when I first showed this slide to her, I, I, I said, should I, you know, you know should, I, should, I, should I fill these characters up? And what about the voice study, which we'll talk about in a second, which was negative, and do I flip the character on its head to show that, you know, it, there was potential for harm in that study, or do I put a shadow in back of it, or do I, you, you know, um, uh, you know, put a puddle under it? And, and and she said, definitely, do not put a puddle under it. Um, she said that because when I originally made this slide, I was using red. Um, and I will share with you all that I keep a version of this slide at home in yellow, just because it makes me giggle. But the point being from these data is the original data for FTDF prep was confusing both to people who might consume prep and to providers. It seemed like it worked in cis men and trans women, but it didn't work in cis women. And what was going on? These numbers were all over the board. And I think we all know that the, the take home message here is adherence. A drug won't work if you don't take it. Uh, for a prep drug to work, it has to be in the right place at the right time um, uh, in the right tissue. And our, as our understanding has evolved, we've come to understand that the agents that are in FTDF get in differentially into rectal tissue compared to cervicovaginal tissue. And what that effectively does is, it doesn't mean it can't work, it can work extremely well in both those compartments, but there's less forgiveness um, in each compartment. Because it gets in better into the rectal compartment, you can take as few as four doses per week on average of this oral medication and still get incredibly high levels of rectal protection. If you take it daily as originally prescribed, you can get more than 99% protection in the rectal compartment. In the cervical vaginal compartment, because the agents get in less well, um, you actually need much more rigorous adherence to get these high levels um, of protection in that compartment. And of course, you know, there are a number of studies now, if you look at um, biomarkers of drug adherence, what we've learned is something that is fairly obvious to all of you, which is if you don't take a medication, it won't work. So um, adherence seems to be the explanation for that original slide that I showed you with all the different data um, uh, with these sort of discrepant results. Um, you have to find an agent that is consistent with people's lifestyle, um, their needs to avoid being identified as someone who might be part of a risk group um, for HIV and therefore the stigma that's associated with it, um, which can actually incite um, uh, 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 interpersonal violence against people. So it's really, really important that we understand what's sexually congruent um, and acceptable for a given population for, to make them want to use it in the way that we would otherwise recommend. Speaking of using things in the way we'd want to recommend, there's this concept called disco dosing. I think many of us um, heard about this right after PrEP was, was approved, this notion of I'm going to go out to a disco or another location on a weekend night in some sort of pre-planned way, and I don't want to take a medication every day, but if I know I'm going to be sexually active this weekend, for example, um, I, I can sort of surround that planned activity with preventive medication, and that's how I want to use this because I don't want to take something all the time. And a lot of us also said, don't do that, that's not going to work. And uh, again, we were incorrect. And Jean-Michel Molina from um, University of Paris in France led a study that was done in France and Quebec 
that sort of blew this concept out of the water and formalized that at least for cis men and probably trans women, this can work. And the study was called Ipergay, and it was a strategy of if you are having planned sex, you can take a double dose of FTDF two to 24 hours before that planned sexual activity, then another single dose 24 hours after that first dose, and then a third and final dose, another single dose, 24 hours after that dose. And it turns out in the randomized controlled trials that looked at FTDF versus placebo taken in that way, you had 86% reduction in incident HIV infections in the active drug compared to the placebo. Now, some people said, well, you told me a minute ago that daily oral FTDF for rectal protection, you can get really high levels of protection with an average of four or more doses per week, right? So is this working because you're being clever and surrounding the sexual activity um, uh, specifically, or is it because you're getting four or more doses per week in on average? And there have been post hoc analysis with fewer and fewer um, sexual acts over the course of a month that suggests that there is something real about this pericoital activity. So I do think that for people who are having infrequent planned sexual activity and the root of exposure is rectal exposure, this is a reasonable thing to do. It does not have FDA approval. It is, the CDC has stopped short of putting it in their guidelines, but a number of cities, including New York and San Francisco particularly, have included it in their guidelines, as does the IAS USA guidelines. So I do think that this is a reasonable thing to do. Jean-Michel Molina and his group in France have gone on to look at this in an open label fashion. In France, they offered the, the cis men who have sex with other men and trans women um, in, that they were caring for um, in the, the France public health system, the option of daily oral FTDF or this on-demand dosing. And it was very interesting, about half and half um, chose each modality. So there were some people who really liked this, and there were others who said, you know what, I'm gonna use the daily intervention. Um, and if you look at the bottom in the table on this slide, what I want you to take home from this um, really is the HIV incidence rates were identical. They were extremely low in both arms. So in an open label, non-randomized trial setting, this really works. Um, and you know, some people have said, well, if you're taking less drug, might there be less side effects? And the two signature side effects of FTDF, of course, are renal dysfunction um, and reductions in bone mineral density. And interestingly, there's a numeric difference in the, the, purport, the rate of individuals having creatinine clearance that fell below 50 in the on-demand dosing. But if you think about it, that's not really a surprise, is it, right? Less drug, less toxicity, that makes sense. Um, what I think we need to be careful about is saying categorically that this on-demand use is safer in any way. It all has to do with how much of it you're taking. And sort of the double secret footnote of this on-demand dosing, of course, is this description of, that I gave you of how you use it is predicated, of course, on a single episode of sexual activity that's planned, right? And how often does that happen? A lot of times people have continued sexual activity and the little footnote on that on-demand dosing is you don't stop that daily dosing if there's ongoing sexual activity until 48 hours after the final episode of sexual activity. So very quickly, this on-demand pericoidal dosing devolves into daily dosing. So just keep that in mind. So it makes sense that you're seeing a trend in that direction, but it's really for people who are having less frequent sex that it makes sense to do it in that way. Hope that makes sense. So I'm gonna move forward a little bit because that was sort of PrEP 1.0. And sort of now we're moving into this concept of PrEP 2.0. And some people even tell me that I'm already behind times and we're really at 3.0. Um, but anyway, there are all these different modalities and products that I think we're ready to talk about now. And I'm gonna briefly go through each of them. 
The first is FTAF, right? So this is new tenofovir, tenofovir alafenamide. We're all very comfortable talking about this as part of HIV treatment regimens where clearly it's equally efficacious um, and has um, less side effects in terms of bone and renal issues, but may or may not have this sort of fascinating property of being associated with weight gain, right? Um, and this was studied head to head in a randomized trial in cis men and trans women footnote, there were actually very few trans women in this study um, that uh, looked at a direct head-to-head -head comparison of FTDF um, and FTAF with a primary outcome of HIV incidence. And these are both the 48 and 96 week results. The take home message from this result slide is HIV incidence, both arms, very low. Statistically, this was a non-inferiority result. It led to US regulatory approval for FTAF for all routes of sexual exposure except vaginal exposures, okay? We have no data to date on the use of this product for vaginal protection. There are studies in the field right now. Um, Dr. Uh, Gandhi already mentioned the PURPOSE trials, um, which uh, seemed to reference only lenacapavir for PrEP, and we'll talk about that in a second. But um, uh, the PURPOSE 1 trial actually has an arm looking at FTAF for cisgender women. So we will get some data um, evaluating uh, its efficacy for protection in the vaginal compartment. But this is overwhelmingly rectal exposures. So really important to know there. Um, and you know this is an infographic that Julia Marcus, uh, formerly of the Kaiser Foundation and now at Harvard, made, and she put it out on Twitter, so it's in the public domain, that I think is incredibly useful. And I've printed it out, and I laminate it, and I keep it in the room when I see patients. Because a lot of people come in and they're saying, shouldn't I be on FTAF for PrEP? All my friends are on it. All the advertisements I see on TV are on it. Shouldn't I be on it? Um, and you know, to me, it is not a slam dunk. I think there are considerations on either side. So you know, FTDF on the left, we have um, experience and data to support its use for both rectal exposures, vaginal exposures, and there's one study for um, injection drug exposures. Doesn't have regulatory approvals for that, but there's one study that does show that it works, 50% reduction, and that was TDF alone, just to be clear. Um, uh, so that's important. Um, there, there is this sort of decrease in creatinine clearance in GFR that's associated with um, FTDF use, less so and perhaps more salutary on extremely sensitive uh, research-based markers um, of kidney function for FTAF. Um, differential uh, short-term DEXA changes favoring FTAF as opposed to FTDF, not clinical differences in fractures, not that you would expect them with the amount of follow-up that we've seen thus far. And then these differences in terms of LDL being more favorable for FTDF compared to FTAF, and this weight gain issue, right, um, which is basically wet, net neutral to slightly associated with um, a little bit of weight loss in the FTDF um, prep patients compared to weight gain in the FTAF treated uh, individuals. And to me, when I point out these four domains where you need to consider the balance here, the renal issues, the bone issues, the LDL issues, and the weight issues, people are able to make decisions for themselves about which they prefer. The other thing I wanna point out is the FTAF tablet is much smaller. So for some people, youth, adolescents, even some adults, where pill size is really a critical component, um, that is something that, that's worth considering as well. I'm gonna move now to long-acting cabotegravir and full disclosure, these are some studies that I was directly involved with. Um, but uh, long-acting injectable cabotegravir, you've heard about it, we've talked about it in combination with long-acting rilpivirine as part of HIV treatment. It's sort of the thing that we're all talking about now. I would love when we get to the discussion to hear all your experience with trying to use it. For me, it's, a, it, it's really frustrating to have clinical trial results that are really exciting and then be really frustrated with how to operationalize it. We'll talk about that. Both HPTN 083 and 084, which are the two registrational trials that led to FDA approval of this product for PrEP in December of 2021, so we're, I guess, 15 months, 16 months since that regulatory approval, were both designed the same way. Two different populations, 083 was cis men and trans women, 084 was cis women in um, Southern and Eastern Africa, 
a five-week oral lead-in, and then a direct injectable to oral FTDF daily comparison. And then we'll talk about this a little bit later, this concept of after your last injection, cover the tail with a year of daily oral FTDF. Um, and we'll talk about whether or not we really think that that's still necessary. These are the results, highly effective, actually statistically superior um, to daily oral TDF FTC in both populations. Um, in the cis men and trans women, a two thirds, 66% reduction in HIV incidence compared to FTDF um, for the CAB treated individuals. In the cis women, this actually blows my mind. This is a staggering result. Right, because we've struggled so hard to find effective biomedical HIV prevention op uh, options for vaginal exposures for cis women, largely because we haven't been very good at giving them things that are congruent with their lifestyles and things that they want. Um, but here, a 90% reduction in HIV incidence for the cis women. In my mind, a staggering result. Um, but it comes at a cost, doesn't it? So what we've learned about the use of um, HIV long acting antivirals is when you break through them and like um, with long acting injectable treatment that Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Iran and Dr. Gulick have all given us the background for the use of injectable products, at least the ones that we currently have comes at a cost. And that cost is even if you take them absolutely perfectly, there is a small, but real rate of failure, and we don't fully understand the why. And part of that failure in the PrEP context comes with an additional layer of complexity. Because you have a long-acting antiviral on board, when it fails in that context of on-time injections, what happens is you get this smoldering, very low level viral load breakthrough as the first manifestation of that PrEP failure. What that means is our antigen and antibody production is delayed, and so our conventional diagnostics are much less sensitive for picking up that PrEP failure. That is why the CDC and the FDA package insert for cabotegravir as PrEP says that you should do a viral load test with a lower limit of quantification of 50 copies or less um, as your screening assay for the use of cabotegravir PrEP because you will find those PrEP failures earlier. And our data suggests that you will actually find them in the majority of cases before they become integrase resistant. Because a consequence of cabotegravir PrEP failure can be when it fails with on-time injections, this is where we see this, integrase resistance. And the question that Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Iran and Dr. Gulick we're all alluding to is we do not know if you can then salvage those cabotegravir prep failures with a dolutegravir or bictegravir containing regimen. My recommendation at this point is not to do that, and we'll come to that in a second, but if you catch it early before there is integrase resistance, that might be an option. Um, at CROI this year, the question came up of how frequently do you need to, um, uh, can you uh, uh, dose these injections? Right now, they're recommended to be every eight weeks, no matter what population you're talking about. The HPTN084 team, which was the cis women team that in Southern and Eastern Africa, presented some data at CROI that suggests that there is likely to be um, protective concentrations of cabotegravir in blood plasma out to 12 to 14 weeks after um, uh, an injection. The problem is, these. this was done in the context of the COVID disruption. These were occasional delays. This is not an authorization of, that it's safe or reasonable to dose it every 12 weeks all the time. So that would be ideal. We would love that, but we are not there. And in fact, um, uh, you know, if you ask uh, representatives from Viv, they will say we cannot support that based on the data at this time. So please do not take away from this, I can dose cabotegravir for vaginal exposures quarterly. No, we are not there yet. But you do likely have about four to six weeks of forgiveness for cis women um, in terms of your dosing. 
for cis men and trans women, you probably do not have that length of time of forgiveness. You probably only have a week or two, okay? So keep that in mind, please. Um, the other thing that uh, is part and parcel of this low viral load failure smoldering that I described, and this was also presented at CROI this year, Sue Eshelman from the HPTN Laboratory Center described this syndrome that she's calling Levi, um, as opposed to Wrangler or Lee genes, obviously, um, to distinguish it from acute or primary HIV infection clinically. Right, acute or primary HIV infection we think is a fulminant, almost volcanic eruptive syndrome with a mononucleosis-like presentation, high rates of ongoing secondary transmission, and, but very brief in nature, right? It comes, it, you get virologic set point, um, and, and, and you sort of, uh, it can go clinically silent. Levi is different. It's low viral load. It's often either protean or completely asymptomatic. It can go on for a really long time. It is associated with resistance if you let it go on long enough. And probably it doesn't have this feature of being associated with ongoing secondary transmission, except in the context of potential for blood donation. So think about that for a second as we consider PrEP, um, uh, the, the recommendations about blood donation in the context of PrEP use. If you have something where you have a long acting product that could suppress detection even by RNA um, of this infection, it makes this a very complicated decision tree. So just wanted to put that out there. So we get asked a lot of the time, what's the best PrEP agent? That's like the number one question that people say to me. What do you want to use? What's the best agent? And I call this making good decisions without good data. Okay, the statistical result for the cabotegravir product compared to FTDF was a superiority one. True statement. However, it doesn't mean for a patient sitting in front of you that you are obligated in any way to switch everyone to cabotegravir prep. The best prep agent is the one that they will take that they will adhere to, and that they will persist with. If somebody hates injections, don't tell them the injection's better for them, because if they don't come in for their injections, that's not gonna be good for them. If they're just fine taking a pill, there is nothing wrong with leaving someone on oral tenofovir-based PrEP. What is the onset of protection with cabotegravir PrEP? Another really important question we get asked all the time. The short answer, we do not know. Why don't we know? Because there have been so few infections in these cabotegravir trials that we don't yet know the correlates of protection. So I can't tell you the time to protection because I don't know what the correlates of protection are. However, the closest thing I can come to a reasonable answer is if you look at the monkey models that predated the efficacy studies that were done in humans, somewhere between two and seven days after your first injection, it seems like you should get protective concentrations. Half people will have um, uh, plasma concentrations that should be protective at two days. 95% of people will have protective concentrations by seven days. That's the best answer I can come up with. I already told you my best guess about the, the durability of the protection depends on the population, probably no more than nine to 10 weeks between injections for cis men and trans women. And I wouldn't go more than 10 or 14 weeks um, for uh, cis women. These breakthroughs, these failures on cabotegravir prep, again, like with the treatment realm, they were, they're poorly understood. I don't have a good answer for why they're happening. I have a theory we can talk about in the question and answer period. Um, and how do you treat these patients? As Dr. Gandhi mentioned, I would recommend either a boosted PI or if you can get a genotype and make sure there isn't transmitted NNRTI resistance, that has been shown to be a good thing, to, uh, an, uh, a thing that works also. Um, what about dolutegravir or bictegravir? We just don't know yet and implementation, you know, are we gonna figure out how to be able to use this? Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. So in my last couple of slides with, for you, just where, where's the future going? Um, so the dipivirine ring was a really uh, exciting concept 
A lot of women wanted it. it. We have analogy with family planning, contraceptive methods, that this is highly acceptable. The one product that came to phase three clinical trials, um, only about 30% protection against HIV. It is never gonna be approved in the United States. It was withdrawn from consideration for approval, but people are not giving up on rings. There are new products that are being put in rings. There are new intervals, like an every three month ring. There are multi-purpose technologies that will have an HIV prevention agent and a contraceptive that are all moving forward in clinical development. So that has not gone away. Um, uh, Dr. Gandhi already talked about Lena Kapavir, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. The purpose trials are ongoing. Um, it's, it could be really exciting every six month subcutaneous injection. Um, Dr. Gandhi also mentioned um, these monoclonal antibodies. Um, people seem to be either really excited about them or really negative about them, and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot in the middle. Um, I, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit jaundiced about their use as a prevention technology. There's one randomized trial that did not work, um, uh, and this was a cross-population cis men, uh, uh, trans men, trans women, non-binary individuals, cis women. Um, globally, it was a single monoclonal antibody. It didn't work mostly because um, a, a large proportion of the circulating viruses were resistant to that monoclonal antibody. Whether or not combinations or multi-functional uh, antibodies could work, we, uh, it's an interesting question um, that remains to be answered. Um, uh, Dr. Gandhi did mention this, so I want to just point this out that in the vaccine world at Croy, we got the results of the most recent uh, vaccine study that we were sort of holding out that there was going to be some activity for. It was the Mosaico study. It was it's an adenovirus vector transmitted mosaic vaccine that was thought to cover um, the global strains of HIV that were circulating, um, and it turns out absolutely zero effect. So unfortunately, we are just as far away vaccine-wise from actually having a product as we were um, uh, uh, 15 or 20 years ago. So that was the most disappointing news at CROI this year. Um, we've already talked about um, Islatravir, so I'm not gonna spend any time on it. Merck did discontinue the oral prep um, program for this product, but they've announced they have a follow-on compound. It's all called NMK8527. If that doesn't roll off your tongue, I don't know what does, um, but that is hopefully going into human studies with potential for an oral monthly administration, uh, and, and hopefully we'll hear more about that as well. Um, the, the last slide I'm gonna share with you is what am I excited about and why you should be too? So four things. So there's a tenofovir rectal douche. What? Yes, um, so uh, this, this is something that uh, when you do surveys of MSM in particular, people want because there's a lot of douching behavior around rectal intercourse anyway, the idea of marrying that with a prevention product is something people want. And again, if we give people choices with things that are congruent with the way they have sex, they're going to use them, and that's really important. So this is actually going into a phase two study, um, hopefully in a couple of months, so we're gonna get data about this. There's really exciting animal model data, so stay tuned, this, this could actually be a thing. Um, there's a TAF Elvitegravir insert that could be used vaginally or rectally. Now, if you had said to me up front, let's push forward the study of a suppository, it's awesome, I don't know that I would have said, yay, sign me up for that. But again, when you do surveys of what people want, this is really acceptable. And the early trials show that this small bullet-shaped suppository is highly acceptable. The animal models and the pharmacokinetics are tremendously exciting. There were two uh, 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 abstracts about this at Croy this year. I think you're gonna hear more about this. Um, Charlie Flexner already stole my thunder here. Personally, the thing I'm most excited about are these micro needle array patches. Think about it, a Band-Aid driven delivery system. 
you put the Band-Aid on, it stays on for an hour, it comes off and you have a prevention product. How exciting would that be? Now, yes, if it has to be a duvet cover size quilt, perhaps not, but that's obviously not the goal. And maybe even if cabotegravir is not the right product for this microneedle array patches, I think we're beginning to hear about these products that are administered at extremely low doses over time that may be better candidates for this technology. So stay tuned for more about that. And the last thing, as I mentioned, this Merck um, 8527 product is another NRTTI that's about to go into humans that could be a monthly oral pill. And I, I can't tell you exactly why I'm so excited about this. When people first said a monthly prep pill, isn't that a great advance? I said, no. Um, but then someone said to me, don't you give your dog flea medicine on the first of every month and you can remember to do that no problem? And I said, you know what? I'm an idiot. Yes. So I do think this is something that really could be game changing. So stay tuned about this moving forward. Um, so in conclusions, we're 40 years on the epidemic. There's still a lot to be done. There's not gonna be a single intervention that's gonna get us to the UNAIDS goals. We're 10 years after the approval of FTDF. We've learned a lot, but really have we gotten it to the people who need it the most? Um, and the choices and these other options for biomedical prevention strategies really are gonna be critical to get prevention, uh, the global decreases in incidence that we need. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much for your attention. I'm, I'm loving all these new things like Levi. It's like wears his war wounds like a clown. Um, if you know that song, anyway, Charlie, just keep going. It'll come on. Turn the mic on, please. There it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, great talks, both of you. Really wonderful session. Um, and I have a question for both of you. Rafi brought this up. I, I guess I'm going to state the obvious. Should uh, sexually active people, in the future it may be both men and women, I don't know, could sexually active people on any long-acting formulation, you know, cabotegravir now, it might be linocapavir in the future, should those people be forbidden from donating blood? Um, I'm gonna turn that around and say, um, right now, I don't think uh, someone who is actively taking a long-acting PrEP product can safely give blood. Um, I think there probably is an answer to the question. I just don't know what it is, how long you would need to be off of a long-acting PrEP product for you to be 100% confident that you could find HIV if it were there. I think it's probably different for individuals born male than individuals born female for cabotegravir because there are huge differences, Charlie, as you well know, between the pharmacokinetics based on that. Um, what people are gonna decide is ultimately okay from a blood safety standpoint is probably different from what, um, what the, the scientific reality is. Um, so I, that's dodging the question, but I think we need better diagnostics um, to allow people to uh, contribute to the blood supply. What are the practicalities of doxypep? My PrEP patients are not using condoms. That's the joy of PrEP. Do you like give a prescription for 30 pills a month and keep doing it? I'm just not quite sure how to use it and how to discuss with people how to use it and who's gonna pay for it. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's the do it's a doxycycline 200 milligram dose. So you would take it within 72 hours after every time you have sex. So in reality, you would prescribe them probably a 30 day of doxycycline, and then they would take two pills, um, and then give them refills on that. Um, you know, people the 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 cis study people were taking it a mean of 27 hours after they had sex. So they're not taking it right away, but they were taking it within the 72 hour time frame. Um, but unfortunately in the cisgender women, it still didn't work in that population. But logistically, I think you would give them a 30 day prescription for doxycycline. 
Joe. Hey, hey Rafi, in, in women on Cabo Tegavir prep who, um, without uh, the oral lead-in, is there any logical reason to check RNA based on um, the OA core results? Because, I mean, the, we're, we're, it was so infrequent that they would become infected. It, I mean, the, obviously the problem with this whole RNA thing is it's uh, really complicating who can get this. Um, and, um, and that was, even in men, that's, it's very uncommon, obviously. Um, and, and as you mentioned, the likely of forward transmission is probably incredibly low sexually, for sure. So I, I wonder your thoughts about that. We seem to focus so much on, on that aspect of cabotegravir as prevention and kind of forget how effective it is. Yeah, you know, Joe, you're asking a really important question, right? In the entire 084 trial to date, there have been six infections um, uh, in cis women, and none of them have actually been in people who were taking the drug uh, on time. So um, it's incredibly rare, and I think that contributed to the WHO's position on this, which is um, even if you can't, or it's not practical or feasible, or, or you can't afford to do RNA testing, your best antibody-based testing is sufficient to use cabotegravir. Um, and, you know, sort of where you're going with this, Joe, I think is it's such a rare event overall that even if it were all integrase resistance, um, is that going to have population level impact? Um, and you are making the point that it's probably not going to accomplish ongoing secondary transmission. Right, so the three questions that I think you care about in diagnosing something earlier is, is there personal benefit or risk? Is there ongoing partner-related benefit or risk? And is there resistance that could then make that in infection more difficult to treat, right? I think those are the three big buckets of consideration. So I, I think we're gonna find out because the WHO has endorsed this strategy, how that goes, what happens to integrase resistance, and what happens with these delays in testing, because what I sort of didn't get into is what happens after the viral load smolders is eventually it does become resistant and then volcanically escape. And if you don't catch it then, then ongoing transmission could be an issue. So there's a lot we don't know. I think the WHO probably made the right call from a public health standpoint about how to figure this out. And there's already a modeling study that suggests that's the right thing to do from a global perspective. Andrew Phillips did a modeling study from University College London, but you know, all models are wrong. Some are useful. So I, I hope it works. Another question in the room and then we'll go to the questions. Sure. Online. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering if you can help me on, um, on what you say to educate your patients um, during, after syphilis treatment, when I try to educate, the difference between cure and test, I mean, it, it, like treated and cured, like Every time I'm like, don't have sex for seven to 10 days. They're like, well, then why are we waiting 12 months? You know what I mean? 24 months, what's happening in between there? I feel like I always am tongue tied as how to explain to them their, you know, decreased rate of transmission, et cetera, during that time. I just wondering your input. Yeah, so, you know, syphilis is, is our great masquerader. It has all different kinds of manifestations. I, I definitely think, so when I see people with active lesions, like shankers or mucus patches in the mouth and secondary syphilis, those are the most highly infectious. So I would definitely educate someone to not have any kind of sexual activity until the lesions have completely healed um, and crusted over or gone away. Um, but it's a little bit harder when you're treating people with a latent infection that are asymptomatic or syphilis of unknown duration. You know, all of those, they don't have active lesions. Um, how do you counsel them, you know? And I, I don't know if there's, a, you know, a correct answer for that. Um, you know, I tell people to wait at least one to two weeks after they've gotten the end of their shots, um, for sure. But, you know, from a public health standpoint, the health department is mainly interested in the early syphilis cases because those are the more highly transmissible ones. Um, so, from that standpoint, you know, you want to make sure, like I said, the lesions are healed and the partners get treated um, before resuming sexual activity. 
Yeah, so uh, online, Jenny Tan has a similar question about um, how to know when there's new infection versus just ineffective treatment. So the example she gives, several of her HIV patients come into clinic, they test positive by serology for syphilis, appropriate treatments given, and then um, they, they typically don't have symptoms, but they come back and the titer is rising again, they've been sexually active, how often do you retest? How often do you retreat? Uh, how, what's your advice for sorting through all that? So it's a lot to sort through for sure. Um, I would always follow RPRs every three months for these patients. I would not do them any sooner than that. Um, and then following a response to treatment, it goes back to that algorithm that I showed you all um, that I mentioned my colleague Jeff Klausner had come up with. Even though he wrote that in 2008, I still use it all the time. So to, to define an appropriate treatment, you want a fourfold decline in the titer. Um, and that, what is the time period that that needs to happen by depends on what stage of syphilis you're in, early versus late, and whether or not you have HIV. And so there's different time frames for when you need to see that fourfold decline in titer based on your certain patient. And so that's why I find that algorithm to be really helpful because that's how I monitor all of the titers in these patients that I see. And if you're finding that the titer has not gone down fourfold when you're doing these every three months RPRs or it's going up, that's a big concern that you may have some kind of treatment failure or reinfection. And I'm not talking about like a one fold dilution change. You know, if you're at one to eight and then you all of a sudden go to one to 64, that's clearly gonna be a new infection. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions about doxy. Um, I'm gonna put them together um, and you can just bounce between you in terms of the answers. We can do it kind of quick. So when you're giving doxy uh, prophylaxis to be around uh, events, event driven, how many uh, pills do you prescribe at one time? You give 20, 30, 16, well, I, I think Christine already made a, 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 an advocacy for, for 30, um, and I think because it's a 200 milligram dose, my practice has been to give 60, because that's 30 days worth or 30 doses of the prophylactic regimen, because um, you want people to have it and you want them to use it if you're doing that. Christine, I don't know if you have a different approach. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess that's, I said 30, you know, just, you know, I guess it depends on the patient. Let, let me put it this way. I think it depends on the patient. If, if they're going to have unprotected sex very, very frequently, maybe every day, or they have multiple sexual partners, absolutely. If, if they're talking about just going out on the weekends and doing this or a couple times a week, you know, it's going to depend. Um, yeah. I think I think it's really patient. I don't think there's a perfect answer. So there, the, the other questions about resistance, that's the biggest concern that all the providers have. And there was the study at Croy that showed so far, not a concern, is a concern. Uh, how are we going to monitor for this? You're talking about doxy? Yeah, for doxy, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I think the biggest, so we know doxycycline we know gonorrhea is resistant to doxycycline. Um, chlamydia, the data right now is that doxycycline is very efficacious. Um, so I think it's right now it's pretty good for chlamydia. And then syphilis, doxycycline is our alternative agent. Um, there was only one syphilis case in the cisgender women doxy pep study. And so I don't, I don't think we can have any conclusions about that, but I think if you're going to monitor for resistance, you would have to grow the organism out in culture and test yep. it. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on it. Yeah, um, I, th I think may I'm wondering if the if the question is is more other organism resistance from yeah. chronic doxy. Well, it, it just in general, I yeah. think the doxy is such a valuable drug. I yeah. mean, it's probably you know the MVP of antibiotics actually when you really think about it as far as from rickettsial illnesses to STI, it's just a great drug. We hate to lose it. And you know, a Annie Lukemeyer, um did present at, at Croy. 
um, the first look at the doxypep study resistance, and what she found was actually um, they looked at um, uh, they looked at non non gonorrhea commensal Neisseria species, Staph aureus, and actually GC um, isolates. They weren't able to actually say much about the GC isolates, mm -hmm. the Staph aureus. Um, I think there was a, a 14 percent absolute decrease in colonization yeah. of Staph aureus, but um, an 8 percent increase in doxycycline resistance in the Staph aureus, and that's with fairly short term follow-up, um, and the commensal Neisseria species, there was no change in doxycycline resistance. So I think we need to monitor it, but um, I, Christine, I don't know what your approach is. It's sort of fascinating to me. We've used doxy for and minocycline for acne for a billion years, mm -hmm. and the world hasn't blown up with doxycycline resistant um, Staph aureus and other species. So I, I'm, I'm a yeah. little bit less worried about it from that standpoint, but we need the data. Yeah, Bob. Um, just as everywhere else, we're seeing a big surge of syphilis in Tampa Bay. Um, a lot of them in my prep patients, unfortunately. The question I have is somebody who's newly infected and you treat them, how often do you see when they come back three months later their RPR is non reactive? Oh, usually very rare for the RPR to go back down to non reactive in three months. I have five. You've had five? Yeah. Very five interesting. Patients. Yeah, I, I just wanted to know how common that was. I mean, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, and uh -huh. I can't say that it, I remember I seeing been able any to of that. It. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. That was very interesting. Yeah. I, I have the opposite question. How how high a RPR are you willing to tolerate as uh, you know persistent seropositive? Um, I have patients who are like you know one to you know 10. 1024, right? And they go down by fourfold, but they're still one to 32. And every time I test them, they're 132. And sometimes they're one to 64. And um, it makes me super anxious. Yeah. So, I, you know, one of my early mentors was Ned Hook, and he's one of our big syphilis experts. He told me his threshold for tolerating a seropast is one to eight. So if it's higher than. <laughs> And this is after you've given the patient the, you, yeah, he does. This is after you wait the time period for the appropriate treatment. But over time, it's going to go down. But if it's sitting at like 1 to 64, 1 to 64, you want to make sure you're not missing something, particularly like doing an LP. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's been a while, uh, Christine, since we've had discussion of TRIC and BV at the meeting. So thank you for, seriously, we talk a lot about gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, so that was good. So there's a follow-up about, for BV, um, a lot of GYN docs are just using only culture. What's your recommendation for BV diagnostics? You mentioned it, but let's dig in a little bit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm BV diagnostics. BV. Yeah, I'm very glad you asked this question. So, you know, the AMSEL criteria, the four clinical criteria are the most commonly used. Um, they're not great. The vaginal gram stain to do the Nugent score is mainly used in research settings. So one of the new things in the CDC guidelines that we did mention are the BV nucleic acid amplification tests. So we also have PCR tests for BV, and there's five of them that are currently FDA approved in the country um, in women. And it's interesting because if you look at what organisms are included in all of these tests, they're different by test. And it's because we don't know the exact etiology of BV. So right now, the only recommendation to use these tests are in symptomatic women. You would not want to use them in asymptomatic women. So, I mean, you basically, you have AMSO criteria, which are not that great, but we do it all the time. Nugent score is mainly in research settings. And now we have the BV NATS. And I just want to reiterate, only use them in symptomatic women. So what about, we talk about TRIC and treating male partners. Do we do that for women who have recurrent BV? Yeah, so right now, even though we think BV is sexually transmitted, the male partner treatment trials to date have not shown a significant difference. Five of them were conducted in the 1980s, 1990s, and I love going through these trials with our medical students just because they have so many fascinating flaws to them and what we would see today. But we did do a randomized control trial 
with Wayne State University um, and at UAB within the past couple of years in the current era, and we did not find that treating male partners of women with recurrent BV significantly decreased women having um, less episodes of BV. Mm. So that was uh, that was an unfortunate study. Um, we thought we think that the women in that study were very highly BV experienced, and their BV biofilm was pretty persistent. So I think that study needs to be done again in women who are just having run of the mill occasional BV cases. And a group in Australia that did the mycoplasma genitalium sequential treatment studies is also doing that BV male partner trial. So it'll be interesting to see their results. So I, w I did wanted to ask you uh, about the cisgender women and doxy. I forgot to follow up. So that one study was out of Kenya, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Are there any other studies ongoing? I hope there are, because we really need to know, right? Yeah, I am not, are you aware of that? I, I think there's one or two others. I'm, uh, I'm gonna need to go uh, onto clinicaltrials.gov to confirm. Okay. I think there's one or two others Because, in you know, it's hard, I would just feel badly if, if from that one study we don't, fully know the methodology you mentioned that the adherence to uh, PrEP was good just in terms of the incidence of new HIV diagnoses, but gosh, I think after the VOICE study, I think we've all learned that maybe we have to either monitor for adherence with drug levels or something, but it, it doesn't add up to me just on face value that it wouldn't work in cisgender women, but we'll see. Um, Time has moved quickly. Um, we're gonna take about a 20 minute break. Uh, there's lunches out there for those of you listening in, just we're gonna break for about that time. They're gonna bring lunches in. If you're at home, get your lunch or late breakfast and come back and we'll reconvene uh, roughly about the top of the hour. And we'll, I'll shorten the cases somewhat because it's a lot of re recap of what we've heard. So we'll meet back about one o'clock. The cases were slated to go for about 50 minutes. I'm gonna cut it down to about 30 because of a couple reasons. One, I wanna get us back on time. But secondly, in preparing the cases that we do today, I was designed, I designed all the questions to reinforce what we've learned. And really through the Q&A, a lot of the points were made and reinforced. So I think we can go kind of quickly through the cases and be done on time. So with that as background, um, here are the um, disclosures. By the way, a couple people said, how do I access the, the uh, slides? And you just click on the presentation and the slide should be available to you as you go. Um, so here's the learning objective. We're gonna start about initiation of therapy, but Dr. Iran already had a case or two on that. We we're gonna talk a little bit more about weight gain and pregnancy, dig a little bit into Abacavir, talk about some STIs and go from there. So this is Dr. Iran's uh, similar case that I put together, but this is a guy who had a viral load of 280,000 newly diagnosed C4 count of 65, wild type virus, normal renal function. So which of these regimens um, might you uh, pick? All right, so we've talked about this already. Um, is there, let's just talk about some of the other options here. Um, we'll get to Bacavir a little bit later. Um, nobody really went for direct to inject right off the bat without following the FDA recommendations. We talked about that. What's interesting is that we've gotten away a little bit from the boosted agents any what are the situations where you might choose a boosted pi in this setting we can change the change the story if you want but what who are the patients that you might do that up front you, Rafi. you told us he was wild type right he did yeah. not have transmitted drug resistance so, so if there's resistance maybe somebody coming off of prep we didn't talk about that specifically but if they've been on a, a cabotegravir-based prep, and they've had Levi, uh, or Levon in my reference, um, that's someone you'd go right to a, a boosted PI, right? I, I think that's one of very few situations these days that I, I would go to that. The other might be uh, a situation where a drug-drug interaction might preclude 
Dolutegra or Abictegravir use as first line regimen. Right. There are relatively few contraindications, but you know, someone who absolutely can't come off continuous divalent cations or something like that, or yeah. or an allergy um, of some sort, uh, that mm -hmm. might be a, a circumstance where I'd use it. But but cabotegravir failure is sort of I think the the probably most um, the the newest context right. in which that would be most appropriate. Can, can, can I can I like dissent? Um, so someone that's failing cabotegravir that has like a viral load of a hundred or two hundred and and you can't get a resistance test. Why not give them bictegravir half FTC? Why why not? What's the what possible bad thing could happen, right? Um, I, I mean, uh, you know, you know, AZT three TC worked in people with um, viral loads less than ten thousand in that study that we published in the New England Journal a million years ago. What, what's the harm? I mean, what, what bad thing would happen to that person? I mean, yeah, you know, Joe, at a viral load of 100, probably nothing, but this guy had a viral load of 200,000. No, 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 no. Well, oh, so you, so someone with a viral load of 200,000, oh, and they're on cabotegravir? No, no, they had broken through cabotegravir. Right, remember the, the sequence. That's something of, that's never happened. No, the, the, the sequence of events that <laughs> happens in Levi, right, is low smoldering and then volcanic eruption. So we've absolutely seen this sort of low wild type smoldering and then you Then 200,000, I'll have to look, okay. Yeah, no. Raj, I wanted to turn to you just uh, briefly about that other option there. Darunavir boosted uh, with dolutegravir as a double D regimen. Uh, that was presented at Croy, right? Yeah, so just to um, go back for a moment, um, this nucleoside sparing regimen, we used to talk a lot more about nucleoside sparing regimens when we were having more trouble with toxicities. Uh, now most of our nucleosides are relatively low toxicity. We've gotten largely away from using a Bacavir. Um, TAP obviously has uh, fewer kidney and bone effects than TDF, so nucleoside sparing regimens are less needed, I think, than they were 10 or 15 years ago or, or 8 or 10 years ago. Um, in the past, there was a study published called Dualis, which looked at if you've got someone suppressed, that can you switch them safely to boosted drunavir plus dolutegravir? And it showed that you could. And as Joe said, there's many ways to keep someone suppressed. At this year's CROI, this D2F study showed us that in someone who's viremic, uh, that you can also use that particular regimen. And in that particular regimen, boosted drunavir plus dolutegravir, a lot of these people would be presumed to have resistance. They didn't, again, show us the resistance, but because they were failing in NRTIs, one would imagine they would. I think this is not, I, I don't think I would use it um, in most instances because you've got the drug-drug interactions, you've got the three pills, or if you use Cobacist, that two pills. And so, I, and it's less well tolerated. I think uh, PIs in general are less well tolerated. So I don't see a, a need to use it. You, you could use it in this resistance setting Right. Uh, if you're pushed to, um, if you have a lot of nucleosides. To me, the, the, the remarkable thing for those of us who've been around a long time remember this, but when raltegravir came out, a lot of folks were just mixing and matching. And one of the things that was done was raltegravir with boosted darunavir. And, oh, yeah, that should work. And it didn't. And so I, it got my attention. A lot of folks in our clinic started using dolutegravir with um, boosted darunavir as a double D, they call it, regimen, and it actually works. So it must be just a more potent um, integrase inhibitor <clears throat> in this setting. Is Remember, one of the theories at the time was raltegravir was twice a day, yeah. that people were probably missing the second it dose. Was, yeah, and twice daily, that yeah. Regimen. Okay, so I've already mentioned that we have um, the folks who are leading the guidelines, uh, here is Raj, and then for HHS is Trip. Um, I think we talked about this, but let's just go forward real quick to reinforce the concept here. This is a, a woman who presents newly diagnosed but has an M184V mutation at baseline. Um, and would that affect what you'd choose? So this was a question a couple of years ago of uh, was the regimen uh, damaged by the M184V? And now there's data that, that support uh, the notion that you don't have to worry about it too much, which I think, Joe, gets to your point of whether or not there's a, an advantage of getting a resistance test up front. Does it going to really change uh, what you're going to do? 
Yeah, no, I, I don't think it does, honestly, um, a change. What, I, I mean, there's obviously situations where, you know, someone uh, on prep, is, as um, Rafi outlined, and um, or maybe someone who has a known partner that with, um, uh, you know, high-level drug resistance and something. Yeah, I, but, you know, we still do it, and I'm certainly not one to say we shouldn't do it. Um, but but it, I, I can't see how... It, the the transmission of integrase resistance mutations is just still you know in the one percent or less range, and you have to look at those studies super carefully because a lot of them list this ninety seven A as a resistance mutation, and it's right. just not. I, I think but, it's worth pointing out. I see everybody pointing to the eighteen percent. Yeah, uh, Trip, you want to make the point real quick? This is one where that, there, we don't have many wrong answers. In this case, the dutegravir three TC in this setting is wrong. Trip. Right, I would be concerned about using dolutegravir 3TC here with an M184V regimen because essentially you're using dolutegravir monotherapy, which we know doesn't work long term. I mean, that would be a reason to do the resistance right. test too. Yeah. It's just, so it's not that dolutegravir. That's recommended, right, for, for dolutegravir 3TC to, to get a resistance test before you use it for initial therapy, right? Isn't yeah. that the recommendation? Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and, and it's not that dolutegravir monotherapy doesn't work. It actually works in the majority of people for a year. Yeah. Uh, it's just that there will be eventually treatment failures, and if you continue it indefinitely, how many treatment failures will, will you get? I think that's still an open question. Right. So the, the problem with this you, doing this in, in individual practice is you could certainly get away with it, uh, but it's not something that I would recommend, given the fact that there's so many other good options. Yeah. So there are two, two situations where you probably would not want to go to dolutegravir 3TC. One is where there's an M184V. Even though there's some residual activity of the 3TC, it's not like it's gone. There's maybe a half a log contribution, but it's not the robustness that you really would want. Uh, and secondly, somebody who's got uh, hepatitis B surface antigen positive, uh, you definitely would re develop resistance pretty quickly. Um, let's move on to the next case, which is about the future. Um, so this is uh, the, all the drugs we heard about in TRIPS talk, uh, just thrown up here in some kind of combination. There's data for some of them already. There's some that are more hypothetical. So most people are sticking with what they know, waiting for data. That makes sense. Uh, I, I think you convinced me, Joe, um, or maybe it was Trip, with the, or maybe it was Raj, with the notion of the uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And, you know, it sort of flashes me a little bit to COVID with broadly neutralizing antibodies that you really, they got to be active. And I think you said that about half of them were, were only susceptible to two and uh, the other half only one out of the two, right? Was that yeah, the, number, the numbers are, are, are there about 124 people screened. I think something like 12 or 13 didn't have a, the test wasn't, um, couldn't be completed. And, and that is, has to do because it was DNA, HIV DNA. And then out of the 112 or so, um, almost precisely 50% were sensitive to both and 90% were s sensitive to at least one. Um, and as Raj pointed out, there is an ongoing study of that same combination in people sensitive to only one of the two antibodies. We don't really know for sure what susceptibility means when you use DNA uh, as the source. Uh, I think susceptibility when you use RNA as the source, I, I think is actually, there's some good data from, from um, Viv and um, from uh, uh, Marina's group, that uh, Marina Kasky's group, that that, <coughs> that susceptibility is pretty useful, but from right. DNA it's not as clear. So that that's, Raj is 100% correct. One other study to keep your eye on is the ACTG is either completed or is completing a study of cabotegravir with an antibody. And so that will, uh, that's dosed, I think it may be monthly in that case, cabotegravir, maybe it's every two months, but monthly. I think it's monthly. So that will at least tell us the concept of if you have a single antibody and a single small molecule, can you, um, you know, what, what happens in terms of suppression. So I think within the next yeah, year or so, I, we might know. Yeah, and I think the thing that's really important with these antibodies is they're, they're going to be much, much riskier in people who are viremic, which is the example that you gave, um, because there's just so much diversity in a viremic person 
Um, and so much ability when there's highly active replication to get recombination. Um, so so whether we'll ever be able to use these um, broadly neutralizing antibodies in the context of a vir viremic patient, I think is not clear. Mike, one, one regimen that you left off there was the once a week oral yeah. regimen. And we should say that different people would choose different options. Yes. What the mm -hmm. patient wants to do exactly. is obviously really important. And that gets back to Joe's point in his talk about matching the regimen to the individual and not to what you want to do, right? It's pretty important. And then some other option, I, I might have voted for that just because I'm flashing back to Charlie Flexner's talk about all these different delivery mechanisms that may be coming into play that could be quite effective and allow for more prolonged dosing. Yes, yeah, so I think we've talked about this. Uh, Joe had a specific case about it. And this one, um, it's someone who started on a Dalutegravir TAF FTC, has done well. He's HBV immune, so not an issue. Viral load's undetectable. And would you change the regimen here? And I think you asked something very specific mm -hmm. like this, but is this something to go to either cabotegravir and the patient sort of um, is um, neutral, um, so you can impose your idea. Let's go ahead and vote. Okay, so most people sort of stay the course. It looks like we're split pretty evenly uh, between the other two. Um, I think we've covered this already. I'm not sure we need to, in the interest of time, we'll move on. But I think those are all viable options. And it's a conversation with the patient that ultimately decides uh, what to do here, but we had great coverage of that. So coming to weight gain, um, and I'd like to reconcile some degree of what I heard was a difference of opinion uh, through the presentations today. So this is a woman who started BICTAF FTC and came in fairly early, uh, viral load suppressed, CD4 count had a nice response, but over the last year, um, has, she's gained um, about 25, 26 pounds, and obviously not happy about that. So do you just stay the course or do you switch her to something else? Um, let's go ahead and vote about what we would do today based on the knowledge so far. Looks like some folks are switching from TAF to TDF. Some people getting rid of the nuke <clears throat> altogether. Um, what, what do you all think? What's your... Charlie. I, w I would refer her to the ACTG 5391 <laughs> switch study. <laughs> okay. Which involves switching such a patient to a Duravarine based regimen. I, I say that. And is, is Duravarine plus? It's Duravarine plus nukes. Yes. Okay. It, it's, 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 it's Duravarine with TDF FTC, Duravarine with TAF FTC or continuing what you're on. Yeah. yeah. So it, it really is designed to answer this exact question. It was what so, Charlie was saying. So, so this, go ahead. We, we've run into an interesting complication with this study at my institution, maybe because our providers are too smart. But we've had several people raise the issue of the ethics of taking a patient off of a TAF based regimen and switching them to a TDF based regimen because it's more toxic. Uh, and, um, you know, the only counter I have to that is to point out that TAF, while it is less toxic in terms of renal toxicity and bone toxicity, it is associated with more weight gain in clinical trials, and it is associated with a modest increase in lipids as compared to TDF in clinical trials. Now, why is but, that? I, you know, I think we could, uh, we, we could argue that maybe it's because TDF makes people feel sick and they don't eat as much when they're on TAF. But, but I think there is legitimate equipoise about uh, taking someone on a TAF-based regimen and randomizing them to a TAF or a TDF-based yeah. regimen. Well, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is that most of those, the, the majority of the bad toxicities of TDF occurred when it was paired with a boosted agent, right? So it's ritonavir or FOBI. And that usually makes it, it accentuates, it doesn't explain it all. But I think this is something we need more information. There was that one study I think Raj covered about where TAF had an effect. I'm going to flip through these real quickly. Uh, but one thing worth noting is that almost all the TAF switch studies where people lose weight are switching from TAF to TDF. 
Raj presented a, a brief summary of a switch from a TAF-based regimen to a non-TAF-based regimen where there was absolutely no change in weight. Um, that was the solar study. Right. Yeah. So people went off um, uh, uh, Bictegavir, TAF, FDC. They did stay on an integrase, of course, but they went off TAF and there was no change in weight. So. Yeah. Um, More so, information needed. Right, yeah. MOI, right. And which is why I would agree MOI with the majority. I think it'd be MOI. premature to, to start switching, even though we need an answer for this kind of question. I don't think we have that answer yet in terms of whether switching helps. So. Right. In fact, we have so some data is, thinking that it, it may not help. So these are data I think that Raj covered, but I just want to reinforce that uh, we have a, a woman who comes in who's pregnant and newly diagnosed because they did the testing. She's now at six weeks, so neural tube is formed and that type of thing. And it's okay to start therapy. What would you choose at this point? Um, and Christine, let me turn to you for this one. Let's go ahead and have the audience vote. So what, what would you do here? Yeah, I think uh, based on what was presented, I think dolutegravir containing regimen would be great because the data is not concerning during, not as concerning during pregnancy. So uh, people either pick TDF, 3TC, or TAF, FTC plus dolutegravir. The majority of the audience picked that. Um, right. So if you ask this question, Four years ago, nobody would have picked dolutegravir right. because it would, had an afavirenz like neural tube issue, and nobody would have picked TAF because there weren't data, and then suddenly there's data and everything goes 180. So it just goes to show that the questions at this meeting don't really change, but the answers really do, and this is a great example of that. And atazanavir, which I didn't put up here as an option, is suddenly falling out of favor for some recent data that's come out. And I've, I think I have the next slide, I think is Raj's slide, so I'll skip it. Yeah, this, this came from Raj. And uh, so the data really does show that, uh, that the dolutegravir works. And Bictegravir, probably okay, we just don't have as much data yet. Any there, was, there was a study at Croy, I, I, I don't know if Charlie looked at it, that looked at um, Bictegravir kind of uh, uh, during um, uh, pregnancy and then postpartum, and it was substantially lower, actually. I mean, Bictavir is a super potent drug, so whether that's an issue or not, I wonder, Charlie, if you actually looked at that carefully. I, I saw that, and it's not totally surprising because there are a number of antiretrovirals whose concentrations drop during the third trimester as compared to postpartum. Um, I, I think the interpretation, which is probably the correct interpretation, is that because Bictegravir is such a uh, potent drug, and because concentrations achieved are probably higher than they need to be, that you can drop the concentration by 50%, and in most cases, you're, for, for a few months, and in most cases, you'll probably be fine, particularly given the fact that it's only available in a co-formulation with nukes, so there's two other drugs that are always being given with it. We should be cautious about it, though. People need to know it's not in the guidelines right now because we have incomplete safety information mm -hmm. in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So I, I would not suggest using Bictegravir right now, starting yeah. it in a pregnant right. woman. And, but and the, go ahead, Raj, I don't know what you're going to say. I was just going to say that. It's a good job of putting it into different buckets. One is someone who's already on it where there may be consequences to, to stopping. But I would agree with Tripp that if you're starting it, um, you, you have a person who's now pregnant and you're starting it, I would probably go with dolgotegavir, TAF, FTC. The reason why atazanavir and even raltegavir fell off and became alternative, one is just um, for raltegavir, the, the dosing was, was twice a day, but also there is a fairly large cohort study in the United States and in some, with some contribution from Switzerland that was in the New England Journal of, of about six to nine months ago. And that looked at a variety of different regimens and the rate of suppression was highest in in women who received dolgotegavir and was a little bit lower in women who received raltegavir or atazanavir, ritonavir. Now, we obviously used that for many, many years. I do think it works in the majority, but I think it's just the convenience of dolgotegavir and the once a day and the fact that we now have reassurance around its uh, not having a neural tube defect. Yeah, I, I was going to mention that. So this will be our last case, and I'm going to turn to the folks to my immediate right because one of the questions that came in from the audience was, what do you do in Birmingham? And I thought, hmm, I know somebody can really answer that. And then we can hear <laughs> what we do in Los Angeles. So here's the story. Um, 
A 35-year-old guy is followed by you, diagnosed with HIV 10 years ago. He's a very, um, he has like two or three jobs, he's very, very active, but not also active sexually a lot. And he comes in with a lot of STIs, about every six weeks, maybe 12, but um, there's a lot of injections um, that are happening for his syphilis and his GC and a lot of doxycycline. So with all the new data that we've heard, especially today, uh, presented a lot of it at, um, at CROI, do you continue counseling and treat each episode, or do you offer amoxicillin or doxy or suffixime? So let's answer the question. I think we'll start in Burke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so mission accomplished. Uh, mic drop, and we're off. So, uh, Christina, what, you're, what would you do? What have you been doing of, as of late? Yeah, I agree with 94% of the audience. I think prescribing doxycycline PEP would be absolutely warranted for this patient. I think we have multiple clinical trial data showing that it does reduce incidence of incident STIs. Um, I would not do amoxicillin because that's an alternative treatment for chlamydia and pregnancy. I would not use that here. And then that cefixime dose is too low. Um, we've gone up to 800 milligrams now for an alternative treatment of gonorrhea. So I definitely would not have done those two. And I would not have done the first one as the patient is getting frequent STIs. One point that I did wanna mention, um, it is important to make sure your public health department uh, disease intervention specialists know about the syphilis diagnoses yeah. so they can do the contract tracing. Right, right. I'm going to actually add this one comment uh, for you, Rafi. Uh, just well, the question is what about forcing? Yeah, that's what I want to know. Vaccine? Why not? Curveball. We hadn't talked about that. I want to make sure we got to that. So let's go ahead and vote on this real quick. Ah, mm -hmm. what are they talking about? What's what are you well, talking about, Willis? Well, Christina alluded to this uh, from the DOXIVAC study, but the background here, just so everybody's on the same page, is that the meningitis B vaccine, which is FDA approved under the brand name Vexero, um, uh, uh, actually has some observational cohort data that suggests somewhere between 25 and 40% reduction in rates of incident gonorrhea in individuals who've gotten that. That's mostly from Canada and New Zealand. Um, so Doxivac was the first randomized trial to try and answer this question. And that was uh, MSM only. And as Christina alluded to in her presentation, this was a factorially designed study that you know, people got um, meningitis B vaccine, yes, no, and also Doxypep, yes, no. And each intervention in the way they reported it was um, compared to the placebo, people who got none, but it aggregated the two arms um, that got the intervention, even though half of those people also got the other prophylactic intervention. So all that to say, the, the estimate that was reported out in that presentation at CROI, which was a little bit difficult to interpret, showed a 50% reduction in people who got the meningitis B vaccine, again, cis MSM, um, compared to the people who didn't get it. The problem is half of those people who did get it also got doxypep. So we actually don't quite have a precise estimate yet for what the efficacy of this intervention is. There's an ongoing study that's being sponsored by the NIH right now um, called the MAGI study. Um, it's being done at a lot of uh, locations around the United States and also in Thailand and Germany um, that is enrolling all at-risk populations, including cis women, and randomizing them to the meningitis vaccine versus placebo, and that's ongoing. It's about halfway enrolled. So whether or not this intervention is ready for prime time or not, um, you might want to use it in individual circumstances where someone is having recurrent GC infections and there might be benefit. It is FDA approved, you can get it. Just know that we have this one study with sort of a point estimate that's a little bit difficult to interpret and we really do need um, a randomized study that will hopefully lead to approvals, but it is safe. Um, uh, so you're not gonna run afoul um, of other issues. 
Um, if you do give it, the most commonly reported adverse event actually is axillary lymphadenopathy on the side that the vaccine is administered, which I think we're all quite familiar now from the COVID vaccine literature. Um, but the long story short, I think jury's yeah. not out yet. You wouldn't be shocked if it worked. Maybe individual circumstances in which it might be and, appropriate. And Christina, uh, what is the status of the Neisseria gonorrhea vaccine? Is that still in development? Uh, I know we had a study or two at some point. Yeah, I think right now, at least our research group is doing the Bexero study. Okay, yeah. And to me, it, I just off the top of my head, the patients who I'm thinking of who are best candidates for this are folks who have had recurrent episodes of GC. So if they get in their own inoculation every six to 12 months. What is it about the meningococcal vaccine or the maybe the future Nasseria gonorrhea vaccine that is different? What do, you, what do you postulate? A shrug? I don't know. I can't quite figure it out. But, well, let's do the studies and see what happens. And then we'll report on it next year, right? Well, thank you guys very much. Great, great tour through um, our topics for today. And great morning overall. Really wonderfully done.